Jesus, son. That's a little out of hand. Is, is that lobbying for or against gun control? <laughs> Neither. He's, he's on his own plane of existence. I'm questioning now. My... The Joe Rogan Experience podcast uh, is brought to you by Hover. Hover.com forward slash Rogan. Go there. You will get 10% off your domain name registrations. Hover is a company that's owned by our friends that own Ting. And uh, they, they, they have the same sort of uh, ideas going into this. It would create a, a non-evil company that puts puts out a good product, has a domain name registrations. They give you a lot of stuff for free that you don't get for free in other companies like who is uh, privacy, um, where you can you know you don't somebody doesn't have to know where you live just because you want to register a domain. Uh, so they, they they set you up like that for free. Um, it's a very easy to use company. Uh, I've wet registered domains myself on it. It's super clean and intuitive. And uh, it's an excellent company. And if you go to Hover.com Rogan, you'll get 10% off your domain name registrations. All right, you fucks. We're also brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform that gives you hosting, analytics, 24-7 support, and domain with annual plan subscriptions. Squarespace has it set up so that you, the regular person who knows almost nothing about coding or nothing, can go and you can make your own website. It's easy. It's intuitive. It's it's super cool to, to try and fuck around with. And you don't even have to pay for it to do it. You try it out. Go there. You know, you don't have to enter in any credit card information. Just try it out. Um, try to put together your, your own website. See what it feels like. And if you like it, you can sign up for it. Use the code Joe2. That's Joe and then number two. And you save yourself some money, you fucks. Um, Squarespace. <laughs> <clears throat> Squarespace also has so encouraging. Setup. I'm gonna. I'm writing this down. I'm typing that's, this in. That's how my people respond. <laughs> um, one of the, the the cool things about Squarespace is it's also set up for commerce. Very easy to do. So you can literally right away get set up and start selling shit. Whatever it is, t-shirts, hats, whatever you're doing. It's super easy to set up. It's exceptionally well designed. Squarespace has an award-winning program design team and user interface experts. So it's a, it's a fucking badass site. If you want to create a website, look no further. Go to Squarespace. And if you enter in, if you go to squarespace.com forward slash Joe, there you go there. And again, no credit card needed. Just try it out. Start building your website. If you decide to purchase it, you use the code Joe. Two. That's Joe and the number two together. You get ten percent off your first purchase. Right. And and by the way, it's already mobile set up. So like, if you have an iPad or an iPhone, it, it already has the the plugins that make it mobile friendly. I know all about Squaresville. Will Will Squarespace help me? <laughs> you know about Squaresville? Like, hey man, yeah. Squaresville, like a nineteen fifty <laughs> gangster movie. Yeah, I hate to say this it, man. cat is Squaresville. Oh yeah. We don't need any more commercials. <laughs> God damn it, David Lee Roth is here. To the music. A living commercial. Squarespace.com <laughs> forward slash Joe. Go fuck yourself. All right. <laughs> Why you make these make the music? Joe Rogan Podcast. Check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day. Joe Rogan Podcast by night. All day. Two things I don't like. One, I don't like, I don't like you fucking with Nick Diaz's voice. You got to stop doing that. Stop doing that. I was going to say, it. is that a yeah. remix or is that a uh, with Nick Diaz's electro voice. typo you digital cyber something? You got to stop doing that. Actually, I thought That's you were number doing one. Number two, you got to bring back the, the English voice. I missed that chick. Oh. Did you have a chick with a British uh, accent? It was a robot chick with a British accent. Oh, that's kind of kinky. Even a, a robot chick with a British accent. So I like that. Nothing about it, man. And was, was it another chick pretending to be a British chick but sounding like a robot? Something along those lines. I, it's like I a, think I know her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one. That one. <laughs> David Lee Roth, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. So we've started yes. off talking about girls yes. with no last names, and I have three. <laughs> yeah, how'd you pull that off? Is that a real name? Yes. David Lee Ross, your real name? That is my real That's name. That's the way to rock it, right? Make it to, sh to superstar status on your real name. Well, I started using the middle name because I thought it sounded more like Southern, you know, oh. which it kind of does. You know. Right. Why Southern? Why would you want to sound more Southern? I don't know. Just <laughs> <laughs> be a Leonard Skinner other way, other way, Well, yeah, you see, there you go. Like, who would ever thought that Leonard Skinner would be a, a name? That's yeah. like a Baltic, uh, Euros. Who would be a Mr. Skinner? That's like a Mr. Giebler or well, something. Well, how about Van Halen? 
Van yeah. Halen's a pretty odd name for a band as well. That was my idea, too. Was it really? I said, on the heels of, like, Santana. <laughs> right. You oh, know, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. This, it sounds kind of dramatic. Maybe it's the name of a uh, uh, a sailing ship or the name of a sailing captain or the name of the wind. That's what I always thought Santana was. You know, it's, it's, yeah. It's the name of the guitar player, but you say it the same. And much like Leonard Skinner, <laughs> all it has to do is be awesome. It doesn't really matter what the name you call it is. You know? mm, Skinner, I, I, Skinner proved that, right? Well, maybe they proved that the more colorful it is, like Schwarzenegger, whoever thought <laughs> that, if you saw that in print, you know, originally in old Hollywood style, you would yeah. look and go, no way. But maybe that's part of the reason it's... So well known. Is I wonder how many so people loud. Arnold Schwarzenegger called up and was like, "See, I told you, <laughs> you didn't know shit. You fuck with my life and you don't know shit." I would have been one who would have thought, "No, you can't go with that long last name." You, you know, you can though. Like even the way Skinner spelled their name was like L Y N R D S K Y N R D. You know, I, I want to. I, you got to get like a name like a verb, like share yeah. or sting. <laughs> Uh, sure. But Skinner pulled it off. <laughs> you, you can pull it off. It's not the right it's, way to do it, but you can You can just make a fucking goofy spelling or something, and it actually can work. There's it's always names like um, Engelbert Humperdinck. Right. Are, are you anybody else in this room old enough to remember that name? He was a he was like a lounge singer, kind of you know in the uh, I did it my way. Yeah, kind of I remember a, Engelbert, kind of a fella. The name. I think it's a real name too. Where did you guys start out? What state did you guys start out? Oh, we started off in the usual state of confusion, but really mostly down the street bicycle distance. Good question, because it is only bicycle distance um, in Pasadena and uh, ah. coming out of high school. You know, it was time, you know, you're playing backyard parties and uh, the occasional wedding and whatnot because you're not quite old enough to play in the bars. And when Van Halen was playing in the bars around here, nobody had any money for a sound system. We don't blink now when you see some big boom speakers, you know, in the corners and there's a guy with, a, you know, he's got his own, uh, well, now you can take your iPod, plug it in, but, you know, a couple of turntables and some people with some cool headgear. Okay, we don't blink when we see that. But uh, coming up all the way up until the late 70s, nobody had that. You had to have a live band. And and we played five 45-minute sets a night, usually five and six nights a week. At ever, this could have been a club right here. All wow. right, this right here could have easily done it. As long as the, a stage meant something that you tripped your toe over. Sometimes it was just marked off, <laughs> and you know, well, the stage used to be there, so technically it's always there. Or, or the stage is in your heart, son. <laughs> <laughs> so you would like basically perform on a dance floor, or oh, an auditorium, oh, many, floor. many times, face wow. to face with uh, the rest of the human race, and we got used to doing that at parties, backyard parties. Where we would rent the light, you know, would get pull up one of the cars and get a uh, a little mini trooperette spotlight for fifty five bucks for the weekend and put it up on top of the uh, gardening shack or the room that you know when somebody has a swimming pool you got to have the little uh, shed that. Uh, uh, all the pool equipment fits in. Well, that's perfect for putting somebody up there. It's like out of a movie, you know, a rock and roll movie. Yeah, but you put the, uh, you know, character up there and uh, give him enough six pack, you know, that he stays up there for the whole show, but he gets progressively drunker or he brings his girlfriends up there and then the roof caves in. Are you guys writing this down? You got to write this down. We got a recording. We're, reco we're recording the whole thing. We'll go oh, back later we're... with the translator. And it'll take, take notes. Check it for veracity. Yeah. So uh, around Pasadena, huh? Yep. Wow. There's a lot of great bands came from California. It's funny how, like, you see states and some states is, like, great bands will blossom out of. And then you see there's a ton of states where you hardly ever see any bands come from. I'm going to wonder if it's because of where showbiz is located because the opportunities are always here whether you're trying to play television or right. get into the movies singing and dancing in the background or you want to be uh, in rock and roll you know mm -hmm. well you got to be discovered by uh, the record company it, you know for 20 30 40 years it was that now uh, maybe it's another method maybe now you email back and forth and you know, you're intercepted somehow. And now it probably there's a novelty to not being from Hollywood. There's probably a novelty. These guys are badass and they live in South Dakota. Like, whoa. <laughs> they live in a place that fucking sucks and they, they're awesome. They, that might be the band, you know. Straight they're up Utah. 
Yeah. They're from Utah. They love Utah. They're Mormons, but yeah. they have a guitar. They were raised Mormon. They technically, they, they still wear the underwear, but they're confused. <laughs> <laughs> confused underwear. I think that's, sure. that's their name. But the band is badass. So all that strife <laughs> and confusion is in their music, man. You always want something from far away, the rarity, right? Yeah. You know, if, if, if it comes from uh, out on the tundra somewhere, you know. You told us before the show that you've been living in Tokyo for the last 10 months? Yeah, maybe a little bit longer, actually. Now well, how did that come about? about? Well, uh, like all uh, like all the best wandering stories, it, it started out a bit unexpectedly. We were going to play the Van Halen band, and um, uh, Ed took sick, and we had to postpone everything. And uh, I was already going to show up a month or two early, kind of get my feet wet, see what it's like being there, as opposed to just visiting. If you go for a week or two or three, okay, you know, you can eat pretty much whatever you want, and you don't really have a, a legit schedule that you're keeping every day. You're probably not shopping for yourself. You're probably not cooking for yourself and that kind of thing. Right. And um, once Ed took sick, I said, you know what, I'm going to stick with the schedule. And uh, I'm going to get there a few months early for the gig that didn't happen. And uh, how long is it going to be before, uh, you know, he's feeling well and ready to play? And they said, oh, about ten and a half months. I said, well, I'll, I'll be busting a groove in Nihongo then. You know, uh, what is the what's his what's wrong with? Eddie oh, Van he Halen? had some stomach issues and some wow. stomach ailments, but he's healed up just, just fine. And we're going to be uh, playing in Australia coming up. In that's about a serious thing, though. Something that takes you out for ten and a half months. Like, wow, that's. Uh, no, he got he got well. Uh, you're pretty astute there. He uh, got well a lot sooner, but they couldn't position the gigs any oh, closer. Oh, I see. You know, we have I to see. make room for baseball season. I see. And uh, a lot of seasons in Tokyo, as so you know. So when you decide to just pack up and go to Tokyo, do you know people there? Are you traveling with people? Like, how, how did how'd you rock it? I didn't know anybody when I went there. I said, uh, you know, in classic old Jack London, you know, let's just sign up for something. And, Fuck, I love that you did you that. You know, I'm going... That's set up shop and I'll find an apartment and I'll use my smile like a ray gun. Zzz, there, you see? <laughs> <laughs> We're friends right away. I learned right away how to say, you know, 15 self-effacing, make fun of myself things. Cause in I, you Japanese. know, in Japanese, when I, well, I knew Hongo guy ahead of days, I mean, right away, my, my Japanese is bad. Please excuse me. And if I make the right funny face, instantly anybody in any room exhales and goes, okay, he's not that dangerous. Do you, yeah. uh, did you try like to use Rosetta Stone? Like, how'd you, uh, how'd you learn how to mm, speak Japanese? No, I go to school a couple hours a day. I go every day of the really? week. Really? Yep. You go and take Japanese lessons. I do. And then, uh, I always wanted to, you know, just, being around the martial arts, you know, you always think someday, wow, if, I, if I'm uh, kung fu, then someday I'm going to go to the temple and I'm going to fly through the air. And then, you know, and, uh, someday if I'm in uh, professional wrestling, then I'm going to go to Vince, Vince's McMahon's place and I'm going to train and I'm going to be called Diamond Somebody and, and I'll do that. And if I throw the ball, I'm going to go to the NFL. So and your idea was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to live in Japan for a yeah, while. Yeah, I've always wanted to wow. go to Japan and train with that sword and, you know, and learn it from the real guys, the real people. And so was the that idea well. that you, were gonna, you guys were going to do an extended tour in Japan? Is that what the idea was? Extended in Japan means two weeks. <laughs> it was only two weeks, really. <laughs> yeah, we, we live in an iPod society now. <laughs> right. Everything is... <laughs> kind of condensed koshore that means but it actually means crushed and uh, everything's kind of condensed there so when you go to japan just touring you're like racehorse and i you know and i admit it hey when uh, when it's time for a touring you want the very best show out of me possible so that's eat sleep race win eat sleep race win and uh what you're going to see through the window is you know, come on if think if you were going to be in the olympics and uh, you had two weeks to do it. Would you be going out to eat at night? No. Would you be going to the movies and out dancing and carrying on? You're there for two weeks for the Olympics. So uh, when we play with the band, then, you know, you really kind of get your face, you know, stay very focused there. Um, but I actually go back and live somewhere. <laughs> wow. I actually uh, will return and go and, you know, spend... 
we say 18 months, that's kind of metric for a year and a half, two years, if we're really, you know, having a decent time of it there. And I don't require much at all. You know, my uh, the size of uh, my apartment is probably as big as that little coffee room back there. And, really? Oh, yeah. You know, I grew up around National Geographic magazines, you know, where there's, there's the guy sitting in uh, uh, the back of the boat, you know, and he's going around the world and he can reach everything. It's like at the desk right here, like in the Brian and everybody. You know, everybody's surrounded by gear and stuff, and you only have to kind of stretch a little bit to reach every. There's the coffee cup, and there's the tiller. I don't know what a tiller is, but you can reach it. And over here is the uh, electro compass, and over here's the camera. And I always kind of dug that. Right. Tour buses are the same thing. In the so back. you like just living in this small apartment? It's like you're you're going back to your roots. You're like roughing it almost. Oh yeah. You bet. And uh, my teachers are very unforgiving. You know, they're very, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Like, do they have any idea who you are? Oh, sure. Kiyoshi and no Tanda uh, no Hoto. <laughs> nice try. What, what did you just look up? Uh, Hotford teacher. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? It's from gangster movies. I mean, who do you think are, you're talking about? Are about? you... Uh... <laughs> Do you still train in martial arts? <laughs> yes. Well, that's part of the reason I'm there, is I train in kinjitsu. I do the long sword, the katana, you know, the samurai uh -huh. sword. Right. And I have a teacher there that I go to three times a week. Wow. And I got to do the homework. And it's, you know, I've worked my way up to that. At the end of the last Van Halen tour, I was in the shape of my life, or as, as, as best a shape as my own life will now allow. And uh, I said, wow, I can keep up with pretty much anybody at this point let's not waste it and i went uh you know ed took ill and uh i just i said yeah i'll still come and i'm gonna move in and uh i got going so you do you train like sword fighting you put mm -hmm. you put like yes that's gear part of on it. and stuff is it similar to kendo like where you you whack each other with uh, fake swords yep we have that we have uh use real swords use the steel swords for doing forms and uh, fast draw, you know, and slow draw. A lot of times what you see in Yaido, uh, which is a, uh, it's kind of a kata, it's slow. Think of it like uh, Tai Chi, for, the, for those of you who are listening to this who are unfamiliar with it. Um, but you do it with swords. Um, fast draw is exactly what it says it is. It's, you know, and uh, keep the art form alive. It's all the same stuff that you would do with a billy club. It's all the same stuff you would do with one of those. Are you preparing for the apocalypse? I am, actually. For when people run out of bullets and you have to samurai sword the fuck out of people? Uh, uh, well, I'll be teaching people how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do during, when the apocalypse hits? Well, I'll, I'll be uh, accredited by then. We'll go to the Diamond Dave camp. <laughs> Diamond Dave camp for survival in dark days. That's a good name for it. Are you concerned with the fear? I, I would wear that shirt, actually. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> Somebody print it. Are you concerned with the uh, food toxins and stuff like that in, in Japan? Like the, you know, the nuclear shit that's going on with the earthquake? Of course I am. And I'm con I am super consumed with that everywhere I go. The only rationalization that I can use, and I do use the rationalization, is that I gave up a lot of my personal rights, just me, Dave Roth, personal rights, to complain about 1,200,000 Marlboro cigarettes ago. Right. And that about 780,000 gallons of Schlitz malt liquor, the, <laughs> the bowl that came in the tall can. Schlitz is your shit? The blue and, and yellow, blue and white and oh, black yeah. can. Well, about 12,000 cans of that ago, I gave up a lot of my rights to whine about what, what I'm ingesting. Do you still smoke? And occasionally, I yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you get that that very that baritone. Is that I what guess. you help you? Well, that's is that the justification. A lot, a lot. <laughs> that's why I do it. Yes. I do that's, it for the fame. I do it for the kids. I um, smoke for the kids. Yeah, let do. them know it's still hip. <laughs> How many do you do a day? How many cigarettes you smoke oh, a day? Maybe two. Two a day. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I'm I'm I got to uh, pull the plug on that. It's hard. Well. I've watched this guy. I watched him struggle. He got he quit once and then went back on it because his cat hurt its foot. <laughs> I'm, and, and you stressed over the cat. <laughs> He was like, that's I, it. What, I was, can't take the shit anymore. Where's the cigarette? I'm just oh, my poor kitty. I'm She's kind of limping a little. 
I f- and and you had a, a, like a moment, right? <laughs> well, there was other things around it. It just was the the breaking point was when my cat injured itself. But, <laughs> the uh, breaking my fian- point. My fiance these, left me and all this other shit at the same time. These are cathartic, uh, like uh, psychoanalytical, clinical moment noise thing you know, triggers that you're, you're associating with uh, things that are not that big, right? <laughs> 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 exactly. You get into the root of the problem. Dave, preach. All oh, this talking cigarettes. I don't know. I went with. Like uh, they used to say to me, they, they, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I'm sure it's hard to smell. Have you ever tried electronic cigarettes? Electronic cigarettes? What do they do? you never seen it? It's this right mm, here. They look it's, like a cigarette. Even it comes with and something. it gives you the tobacco, but then. mist comes out. There's no smoke, and it's not bad for your lungs. Check this out. Watch this. I see. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's you just get the, the nicotine, nicotine. gives you the fix. And you can smoke anywhere. Yeah. Haven't you seen the Steven you Dorf commercial? No, I'm, 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 I'm familiar with this to some degree, but t- isn't that a lot like lap dancing? Jimmy, can you tighten this thing? <laughs> this is, uh, this is moving around is, on Is it like lap dance? No, <laughs> no, it's definitely different. It's, um, the, the idea behind it is it gives you all the nicotine, but it does, you're not smoking any burning, chemicals ah. it's like it's like a vaporizer that delivers nicotine okay That's well i'm like. not going to make fun of nicotine because um if you look back in all of our favorite authors and all of our favorite jazz musicians and a whole lot of other folks involved um nicotine plays a huge part in what they did sigmund freud used sure. to smoke what two boxes of cigars a day Mark Twain, yeah, same thing. Yeah, the list is long. Winston this Churchill, is... two boxes a day. Yeah, there was, uh, well, I forget what intellectual, very famous guy, Englishman. Uh, he would uh, he wouldn't fly unless he could get a seat in the back so he could smoke his pipe. Like back, that was back in the day when you were allowed to smoke on cigarettes. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, but I'm I'm gonna wonder what Bertrand the main Russell. connection is. There's a big connection between nicotine and people who are the real cerebral players of our culture. Because it relaxes you, you know. You're not. Well, it's a good. Uh, it's not bad. The real issue with nicotine is the delivery method. The where where it's really toxic is in all the different chemicals that our lovely government has allowed cigarette companies to put into these fucking things to to make them more addictive. That was the, the Russell Crowe movie, Insider. Did you ever see that movie? Great movie. Russell Crowe plays a scientist who works for the tobacco companies who's formulated various chemicals that make you addicted to cigarettes. Your your addiction to cigarettes is so intense and so extreme because. They've allowed the cigarette companies to engineer their cigarettes to have the maximum amount of addiction. It plays on several key factors in your, 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 your biological system, and it was all detailed in this movie. So it's not the cigarettes. It's not the tobacco, rather. It's all the other shit. It's 590 different chemicals. It's not just tobacco. Like, if you buy, like, American spirits, that's just tobacco, right? Is that the yeah, that's just tobacco. Or if you buy your, that stuff where you roll your own, those are, that's actually tobacco. It's supposed to be way better for you. The real issue is all the other <laughs> shit in it. I mean, it's never going to be great for you. You're smoking, burning plant matter, but it's think, definitely way better. But you know what? Japanese energy drinks have nicotine in them. Are you wow. serious? Yeah. I had uh, uh, one of the translators uh, relate that to wow. me because I, I had one that was like really mean looking and it made me feel mean. I was like, <laughs> you know, I was yelling at people and it was, I was angry at inanimate objects and stuff. And wow. It, accusatory, you know, and this kind of thing. And uh, I thought, wow, this is great. I wonder if I can get this in the States. So <laughs> That's a good idea. That's hilarious. We should, start, we should bring that out. <laughs> yeah, why don't? Well, it's probably illegal. They probably wouldn't allow them. Yeah, and I had her translate. And I wonder, can you put nicotine in drinks here? You must be able well, to. Well, you could get think. nicotine gum and just chew that shit. I know uh, a lot of writers actually advocate that. Pe- for people who aren't even addicted to nicotine, not for trying to kick it, just for a stimulant for the mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of in a circular way what we were just starting to talk about yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, uh, cigars too. I love like a cigar buzz. C- cigar buzz is a great buzz. And there's a connection to world power there. See, probably right. Although I mean, <laughs> all those guys when they're done killing and fucking dropping bombs on people with a big fat cigar. Exactly. Shane, pulled it off, Shane. And yeah. I don't. I don't think any of my favorite jazz music could have been made or 
composed or played in a smoke-free environment. Yeah, well, you came from a time where clubs like the nightclubs were all smoke-filled, right? Completely smoke-filled, and every movie yeah. was smoke-filled as well. Yeah, yeah. You look at all the old black-and-white movies, it's astonishing how much tobacco is consumed. James Bond movies are particularly oh, yeah. specifically why I smoke. There's nothing weirder, though, than going back and watching those TV shows where a doctor is talking to a patient while smoking a cigarette. <laughs> the, have you ever seen that? Yeah. That is a trip. That's one of the weirdest things you could ever see in your life. But those 1950s shows, that was fairly common. Mm -hmm. Like the doctors would be reviewing your chart with a cigarette. People didn't know. No, they really didn't. That's amazing, isn't it? How could you not know? Does James Bond <laughs> smoke now? I, you know, that's so funny. I watched uh, Skyfall today. Does and he? he? I don't remember him having. I don't think he yeah. does oh, anymore. Oh, oh, oh. He drinks and fucks still, though. Thank God for that. Yeah. We're, we're Sean... pussifying all of our fucking heroes, man. Well, Sean Connery was smoking Rothman's King Size and in Goldfinger, and that's where I saw it. And I, you know, that's I went out and in. I got a pack of Rothman's King Size, you know, the blue ones. What mine, you mine was from watching you. That's how I started. <laughs> <laughs> well, what brand did you start from smoking you, from watching me? I got it from watching you. <laughs> Lucky Strike Unfiltered. <laughs> no, really, that's a, you know that's a telling thing, man. You, can, you know, when somebody says they're a Dave Roth fan or a Van Halen fan, more appropriately, it says a lot about your uh, sense of humor and your fighting spirit. <laughs> <laughs> In my love for strippers. <laughs> so that's fighting spirit. <laughs> Let's keep it alive. Well, that's part. That's subgroup A. <laughs> what is the name of this uh, nicotine beverage? Do you remember? Does it have an American name? I think it's in a lot of them. Anything that has an exclamation point or a black label on the front of it. Had I, you, you guys have been to uh, Tokyo. Yeah. You've been to Japan. What was your experience just shopping for the easy, like, chewing gum? Did you what, Did you try any of that? No. Like, we, we, we were only there for a couple of days, I, but we did. did. And what was your experience? It was really easy. You just because they all barely knew a little bit enough English that that you could just go in and like, "Hi, how are you doing?" And then they tell hi, you how much it hi. was. It was easy to do that. I, it was hard for me to find certain things like like you know like soapies or like hotels and stuff like that. Like I I got lost on foot trying to find my way back to the hotel, and you know it was impossible for me to do that. So. I had to go to one of those little police stations that are sure. on every corner, and he had to draw me a map, and it was weird. Not unusual. Yeah. Not unusual. <laughs> it's like going to Jupiter. Yeah. People say, you know, okay, uh, there is a lot of English spoken, but you know what? It's like learning Spanish in the school system. It really is like an alien world. When you go to Tokyo, it really is. It's The culture is so different. It's so different. Everything is different. Yeah. Virtually everything. Just shopping for dental floss is a whole different experience. And the way that you uh, approach people, you know, back, back and forth, the respect mm -hmm. issue, you know, even though it may just be sugarcoating a, a really sharp New York City sense of uh, business and purpose, you know, underneath all of the old fashioned, you know, and, and so forth is. Every bit is savvy, right? Every modern cop sure. thriller that's yeah. on the movie screens today is, you know, is right behind that guy's sunglasses. You know, they're as modern as can possibly be there. So, yeah, but that sense of tradition still stays. Woo! It's very, very strong and important. Clean. You do take your shoes off. Yeah. When you walk into a person's place or when you walk into a decent restaurant or whatever, you do take your shoes off. And there are a lot of little. Uh, Things you, you have to learn. A lot of like little that. P's and Q's. You bet. Now, do you are you living with people that you're friends with from back home, or you just go by no, yourself? You no, just totally I mean, went solo. Yeah, my dog. Wow. You know, so you put the dog in like a, a ship for like. You yeah, know, there's a way a you, you ship or... him around, and uh, he goes <laughs> he goes through the European way so that he doesn't have to do uh, 14 hours, you know, in a row there. But uh, people do it all the time. Wow. And uh, there's not a lot of uh, gaijing, which is, you know, for uh, Japanese for foreigner. There's not a lot of gaijing faces there, which uh, I enjoy. I ride my bicycle everywhere. Wow. And I'm up and down, uh, you know, I'm uh, I, like in New York City, I'm kind of uptown as well as the downtown, you know, look at the parking lot for a Van Halen gig. You've got a Mercedes Benz parked next to a Harley Davidson. <laughs> 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 and nobody blinks. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I think that would be you such know, a You know, that trip. same audience is, is you know, uh, 
is, is are the neighborhoods that I'm a forwarded access to. Do you follow? Mm-hmm. What kind of a neighborhood do you live in in Tokyo? Like, what do you? Uh... Oh, I live in a pretty classic little place. It's a apartment building. Everything's vertical. Vertical communities there, and uh, I live up over a shopping mall that has a twenty four hour uh, grocery store underneath. All right, and that's in the basement. You follow? Right. And then uh, there's uh, restaurants and shopping and then um, uh, all the coffee shops and everything that we have here. It's really international where I am. Um, Just 10 minutes away by bicycle is way downtown. And that looks like the Star Wars, you know, the bar scene. Right. Where everybody's kind of mixing and matching, you know, 15 different styles of... You know, one person, you know, outer space meets surf, 1970s times uh, Ninja Warrior times uh, Dreadlock Holiday meets, uh, you know, they go on and on because they don't have neighborhoods. Right. They're just picking and choosing from, you know, different stores, from different websites, you know, they don't have neighborhoods like here. We have, say, North Hollywood. Right. For the artists. You you have Silver Lake for if you're an artist or whatever. Um, If you are um, up and coming uh, student in some sense of the word, you'll stand down near USC or whatever. They don't have places like that. Well, no, everybody's kind of mishmashed together. So you're not, uh, you can be even more creative. It's not like you're growing up around a whole group of people who are all doing the same thing you're doing. You kind of create yourself in the mirror differently every single day. Now, did you find it hard to make friends there to like, like have people to have conversations with in English? I mean, I would think that that would well, wear on me after a while. If well, I yeah, but I don't do a lot of listening anyway. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's cool to just talk to people that barely speak English and rattle off at them. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, past tense, who needs it, really, Joe? <laughs> That's hilarious. I was, so, as I learn, you know, I'm, it's almost kind of a hermit-like existence in a certain sense because you don't. It's uh, you can't have it be that very, yeah. very easily. Um, I like it because I'm in constant contact with people. I do class with a variety of different teachers, and out of that comes my friends. And this is where we're going to go tonight. And you know, why don't you come visit over here, etc. You know, and. Uh, that being said, uh, conversation with folks is as fast as you can learn it off of uh, from their language teacher. You know? right. Japanese is heavy lifting. I've uh, I've learned uh, pretty fair in Spanish. You know, I can get us in trouble and halfway out in Spanish. <laughs> you know, you can, uh, under duress, <laughs> under spotlights. But uh, in Japanese, mm, well, I can get everything done that I need to do. I can get shopping done. I can go down do the, do the, the dry cleaning. I can do the taxi. I can, you know, uh, get my way through the movies and the restaurants. So you're whatnot. fairly fluent now. Uh, enough that I can translate for me. I'm not quite at the point where I can translate for you. you know? Can you translate for you if you're watching something on television? Yeah, well, I can tell you the story. I can tell you the plot line of what's going on, who's doing what, and you know what each guy is and what he represents. That's when you're watching that. Is it like an instantaneous thing, or is it like translating after you hear something? Like, are you like recognizing what he's saying? Like, are you thinking about it in Japanese? If if that makes sense, Mm, it's kind of like listening to somebody who is your own age that you know is a compulsive liar. So you're trying to pick out exact words that. <laughs> that may or may not make sense. <laughs> you, can, you turn to your friend and go, okay, Bobby, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, there's been a good, there's the last night late. Late. Okay, and you print that one word. <laughs> two checks. And there's two checks, and you print that one. Uh, <laughs> six pack of beer, and you print that word. <laughs> and so, now you're getting the real story, and you're, you're comprising it of... Of all of the other uh, uh, white noise that your friend Bobby may be discerning, you know, dispensing, that's where I'm at in Japanese television now. If I'm watching a sitcom or if I'm watching a movie, then I can tell you what's going on and who's saying what to who, but I can't get it exactly, uh, you know, word for word what's going there. Are you doing some sort of a web show from there? 
I've been doing the Roth show for the last three, four months. I think we're on our 10th show. And uh, we finally just started talking about it. That's part of the reason that I'm coming around through the pass here. I love broadcasting. It's, I love just, you know, as we're doing now. Just, right, you know, shooting the shit on the yeah. air. Beautiful, I, I free. I miss that, yeah. you know. Well, I, na- what you can do now is probably so much freer than you could do when you were trying to, when you are doing terrestrial radio. When, you know, you did that for a while after Howard Stern, right? A while. He means four and a half months. <laughs> it's a while. I mean. Yeah, they, it, that, yeah. Was a, it, that was a, a trial. That yeah. was heavy lifted. It was, uh, I had said to them initially, uh, you know, f- folks, let's uh, try some new things here. You know, to just go back into the already set mode of, okay, you're going to need a traffic girl. You're going to need a sports block. You're going to need, right. uh, you know, morning team kind of uh, approach. I says, I'm really not interested in doing that. And um, uh, I guess they thought I would get under the wing and then, you know, we would progressively reach that point. And uh, we never really got under the wing. I love broadcasting. I love talking. But uh, when I got fired, and uh, I can see, you know, I can see the look over here. You know, my my, my general uh, tone when somebody said to, somebody said to me in Japan, he said, "Dave son, so you got fired from big job in radio." I said, "Would you ever get fired from McDonald's?" <laughs> <laughs> What? Was that like a sore spot for you <laughs> when, when you got fired? No. 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 Are you kidding? Are you happy What'd you ever it? get fired from? <laughs> um, <laughs> you got to compare notes. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> like in it? high school, dude, that's nothing. I got fired from Burger King and <laughs> McDonald's. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it, it, their reasoning was uh, that my humor was good, but it was not early morning humor. What does that even mean? Well, I just, you know, I was doodling around with, you know, adult concepts. My thoughts are to replace Stern like that, what they should have done is just with no explanation whatsoever, put a Mexican show on full Spanish and not say a word. Fuck you. Who cares? This is what we have on. Leave it on for a month and let everybody get all their complaining out of the way. And then after a month, you throw the Diamond David Lee Ross show on, and everybody's so happy to hear someone speak English again. <laughs> and they're like, listen, we, we got through this, this dark period of oh, it turning into a crazy Mexican station in New York City. Oh, I, you're, making, Dave, you're making clear sense. It didn't make any sense to try to replace Stern. My point is no one could have done it. It was impossible. Even if your show was amazing, they would have never allowed you to replace Stern. You're replacing the greatest guy in the history of radio by far. So anyone who went on after him was sort of like a you were a, you were a sacrifice. I looked to try and do something completely different. I had said to them, for example, after a life of uh, danger and intrigue, why would I stop now? We can install uh, IS lines in a hotel room. We can go yeah. up on a yeah. roof. Yeah. We can go from a basement. I don't mind waking up at 2 in the morning and interviewing somebody who just finished his show in Las Vegas. Right. And, you know, etc. Why would we? Why can't we at least start there? Yeah, and that and was a big you, hurdle. So you're going to do things through Skype as well as do things with people that are in Tokyo. If you yes, you know, exactly. Yeah. And and I'm going, sure there'll be a lot of people from, in Tokyo as well, right? And broadcast from uh, different recording studios because everybody's got super modern. Everybody wants to be part of what's happening right now. You know, especially in the economy, everybody understands a little more that promotion you know get get involved you might not make a penny right now but you got your face out there you got your name your brand your your studio your whatever so people are a lot more flexible to that and you know what we crashed and burned they just couldn't see it the idea of you know that uh, i wasn't going to be in the exact same studio every morning that became a real trudge Mm. and you know getting up at uh 4 30 in the morning that's bullshit that's the roughest job in all of show business especially for a rock star i mean most of your shows are at night you probably sleep till noon most days wake up feeling great 
to get up at four instead of that, to get up eight hours earlier than that. Oh, or just fuck. stay awake the whole night. Well, well yeah, it's, you know, you're, you're backing into the truth. It's not the getting up. It's the having to go to bed at what time? <laughs> <laughs> the extra four hours, though. <laughs> That's like some Buddhist stuff I just did right there. <laughs> if, it wasn't, if it wasn't like that you had to be on for four hours, I would say you're better off staying up. Yeah, that's you know, what or or going to going to broadcast from Hawaii, guys. Yeah, you get yourself a suite at the Marriott something, right? right? And I think you start at midnight or mm-hmm. something like this. Yeah. So you know you can kind of you know that's a good move. Balance out your thing, and you can do pre taped stuff for half of it. Yeah, know? midnight from Hawaii, dude. I just figured <sighs> it all out. The <laughs> studio. David Lee Roth just nailed it. The new studio will now be nice. on the Big Island. I'm gonna buy Terrence McKenna's place in right. Kona. You, and and you go uh, high speed, yeah. low drag. You go with uh, mobile and lethal, and so. I, that you can put everything in some pelican cases, you know, yeah. and then you're, you can Dude, move and you get a. We need to buy Death Squad West West. <laughs> West West. Death Squad and, West West. This is Death Squad West right now, but Death Squad West West will be. And you can get yourself with a balcony. With, you can tune the room so you can hear things outside. Dude, midnight, you know, man. Come on. You know, you let's on let's the go to Japan. Let's even go Wester. Let's go. Wester. <laughs> That's too West. That's, we'll never get a show on the air that way. But traveling, though, that uh, even if you hate, especially if you hate where you are, yeah. going boo is way more fun than, than going yay. You yeah. know? So if you hate where you are, so you had a particularly bad day of somewhere new, was my thinking, then it's it's part travelogue. There's part uh, uh, you get to a little bit of reality, get to live the life of... You know, when we go on the road, when we go and travel. Do you know what a great, re- by the way, what a great, like, travel channel type show it would be? David Lee Roth living in Japan. Do you know how I, how awesome. many people would watch that? you know how badass that would be? It's uh, pretty colorful. And, it's a uh, fucking great idea for a show. Someone should jump on that. I, I, uh, you would know, you my... do it? Would you do a show, like, showing people what it's like to, to live in Japan? To be a superstar rock star all of a sudden... Living in Tokyo in an apartment, taking fucking sword fighting classes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty it's, awesome. It, it, <laughs> yeah, actually. It's a lot better than tr- fucking storage wars. <laughs> you know, watching people bid on things. On fake the things. fuck is that? Yeah. yeah. Do you know, you know who my uh, closest friend there, who's my uh, senpai, who's kind of my teacher and mentor there is, uh, Konishiki, the, uh, one of the greatest sumo fighters of all time he wow was the, he was if you get on the uh google web here you'll find him kanishiki kanishiki is uh he was the one of the first outsiders hawaiian to come in and start fighting this was about 20 summers ago and uh, his fighting weight was 600 pounds jesus yeah wait do you see some pictures of him. he's when he, he's been, he's a national hero he does all kinds of ads for everything you know for airplanes and you know the 711 and you wow. know and kids stuff he has his own show a television show I rem- yeah i remember hearing about him there you go how much does he weigh now that he's retired did uh, he lose a lot of weight yeah, he looks like he's about 300 wow yeah, still, still a big giant dude. Oh, he's the winningest guy ever. He stayed when he first uh, got on the uh, plate. He, you know, these guys are never supposed to win, and uh, he won twenty three times in a row. How crazy is it that you could lose three hundred pounds? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how crazy is it that you could eat like that? That would be glorious, man. Can you imagine anything you want, basically? Well, for they breakfast? go for like the heaviest, high, most high calorie shit they can get in their bodies, right? That's well, I, 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 not, I, you not only took me down to the tournament, okay, which is called the Basho, the huge tournament which takes place in the sports arena. This is where we play, the rock and roll bands play. But uh, we went to the gym where all the beginners are working. You follow uh-huh. all of all of these farm kids who are like in their early twenties. It's think of it like uh, special forces live together as a fraternity kind of a thing, and that's how these uh, they're called rickshi. The wrestlers start off on that. Even the even the referees start when they're fifteen, sixteen years old. And uh, we went and uh, had what they eat. And you know what the trick is to gaining weight? If you really want to be three, four, five hundred pounds, is don't eat breakfast. 
don't eat breakfast. Really? Cause, yep, because your body, after about three days, will figure this out, and it'll slow its metabolism down so that when you finally do eat lunch, you'll get real tired, you got to take a nap, and your body is working real slow. You follow? Uh-huh. So it doesn't burn the food. Uh, it doesn't burn it off uh, super quick, and you'll gain weight a lot, lot faster. That's the ticket to growing up like a sumo player. So they have a strategy to when they eat. They uh-huh. have a strategy to slowing their metabolism down. Correct. They have like an anti-athlete strategy. That well, yes. <laughs> I've been on that diet my whole life, by the way. Yes, that's no. That is their that is their way. That is the technique. Wow. They don't eat until about uh, twelve o'clock. And That's then they and they eat about ten thousand calories in that one meal, and then they go to sleep, and then they wake up again, and then later on at dinner about another ten thousand calorie meal. How much health repercussions do those guys suffer? From huge, that? huge. Must. Yeah, you can't escape the cheeseburger, man. Yeah. But uh, that uh, that is the weight gain ticket. If you want to start gaining weight quickly, skip breakfast. Wait until about noon. And then you can eat all that you want. <laughs> if you want to be a sumo. Yeah, yeah. you want to get wow. huge. And uh, and some of those cats are huge. Oh, my God. It's like a wall, a piece of wall. Do you enjoy watching? Coming. Is it fun to watch? Oh, man. Well, once you get to know some of the guys, because they're like, like the wrestlers we would know here. You know, some guys are, um, for example, when they throw the salt, you dig? That's like to purify the grounds. But there's showbiz involved. Like one guy takes it and he throws it, but he doesn't look. It's kind of like a way of saying, screw you to the other wrestler like that, which you're not supposed to do. There's another guy who takes a whole scoop full of salt in his hand and he throws it up in the air and he stares up into it like Walt Disney, staring into the future and kind of a thing that he does. And then there's another cat who takes two little pinches, he throws it, walks away, then he takes another, and he throws it. And then he throws the whole fucking box. <laughs> and it goes, uh, that's like almost about two pounds of salt. <laughs> and the referees act really angry, and they get really pissed. And the audience is full of ecstatic glee, you know, because he broke the rules, you know. Oh, and that's he, hilarious. Oh yeah, and there are there are some guys who are technicians, you know, in terms of um uh, uh, fighters. Okay, you know, think like judo. There are other guys who uh, like uh, so like Kanishki here was describing. He knew it all from football. He'd been playing football for uh, uh, Hawaiian coaches in Hawaii since he was in grade school. Clearly, you know, clearly a, a, a kid built like that was playing defensive tackle, defensive guard, defensive everything. Yeah. From the time he was a toddler, they put him in a football uniform, you know, in grade school. And uh, so he learned all of his balance. He learned all of his agility, you know, moving side to side, lateral movement, responding to a coach's, you know, cue and, you know, learning plays, how to work with a team, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, so, you know, when he stepped into the ring, so to speak, he was using football on these guys. And he didn't even use the basic where you put both uh, hands on the ground. You all know that sumo right. position. The idea in that is that you want to get bulldog low so that you come, you dip down and come up under, like in a scrum, like in rugby or uh, in jujitsu. You want to be the one who gets up under, right? right. You know, you get you get to the knees first. You want to come in as low as you possibly can. And uh, he never bothered to do that, which infuriated everybody. It caused a big stir. Is it legal to start without both hands in the dirt? We don't know. Nobody's ever tried it. And there was That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. Oh, yeah. And there's placards outside and demonstrations about we can't allow outsiders into our national sport, you know. But the national sport is going to pass away unless we have outsiders and you know it's great show business so what is his stance how does he enter if he doesn't have two hands touching the ground what does he do like a defense like a defensive uh, tackle or a guard where you just kind of get uh, your get down low and you get your wrist on one knee and then the middle of your forearm on the other like you're going to come up under with that shoulder ah. it's pretty familiar you know basic football 
you know, posture kind of a thing. But in the sumo world, well, is, is that legal? Aren't you supposed to touch the ground? Well, he did touch the ground, but now he's doing the Hawaiian lean. And now you have kids, more importantly, all over the country imitating an outsider. Yeah. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah. They're, you know, they're doing the Hawaiian lean. It's sort of like <laughs> Tebow when he gets down on one knee. And then these kids in high school, they're imitating a virgin. <laughs> it's really similar, right? It's like you don't want you you're like, hey, you cut that out, you fucks. It's not that guy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's not your hero, goddammit. So, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a kneeling virgin. And uh he was not slated to win right away, which he started doing. Because, uh, you know, a lot of these kids who start off in sumo, they're farm kids. And they don't have any real you know, sporting skills. Mm -hmm. You know, they've seen it on TV. They're just whatnot. strong. Yeah, you know, big, strong. And uh, they'll come down, and they'll start living at the stables, like boxing stables, you know, that's what it's called. Did you ever see a mixed martial arts event in Japan? No, I never have. Oh, I've, I've, seen a, I've seen a thousand of them, uh, you know, on television. There was a huge one last weekend. Vanderlei Silva just fought uh, this guy Brian Stan last weekend in Japan. You know what? I saw it on the cover of Metropole magazine, which is one of the magazines that you know is the uh, is the for English spoken, whatnot. I saw them on the cover and whatnot. How long were they there? Just for one weekend? Yeah, it was just one night of fights. But the the audience is so interesting. Like what, Brian, you you experienced that when you went to the UFC there. They clap. They're so polite. They're very quiet while the fights are going on. And anything technical that happens, like a reversal, a escape, like anything where a lot of people wouldn't cheer, they like, they're like anything where you progress, like you pass the half guard. He's in the mount. Oh, they get. Yeah. They're very polite. It's the really interesting. only people yelling. I would like look back to see who was yelling because there's like only a couple, and you would see. Oh, it's just U.S. military dudes. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> 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 to get us anywhere. We're like yeah. kick his fucking ass. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Japanese people next to him are like, "What, what the, the fuck, heck? man?" Totally you know, not observing. No, you're describing something that is absolutely accurate. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Absolutely accurate. Um, I was just on the phone with Alex Van Halen and talking to him about we're going to be playing at the Tokyo Dome. We're playing at the big arenas there in Japan. And I wanted to remind him of exactly what you just described. That in, in the United States and in Europe, you have what's like an idling cheer, a scream. That's, that's, that's It's kind of like a car idling. Yeah. But it idles like a drag racer. Like you depend on it in yeah. the way you do your spiel, your talk, your punctuation. You know, the, the Bill way Cosby you, eating pudding. Blah, 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 blah. You let them go. You know, when do you now say the next thing that you're going to say? You know, um, so you're listening f with that. And uh, when Americans cheer, there's it's like a car. Like I think it's called blower wine. Right, you hear it. Right. And it, it, it goes for a long time. And if you're waiting like to say something next or whatever, you're listening for that. And you're listening for it to hit a certain point volume wise or duration wise that you now interrupt now. It's a little bit like a dance. You follow? Yeah, I, absolutely. Otherwise and if people are making the long noise, they enjoy themselves. Great. Let them enjoy themselves. You know, they, they love hearing their own power. Yes, we are strong, we're wonderful, we're young and skinny. <laughs> You know, whatever the fucking thing is that night. <laughs> right. But in Japan, you don't get that. Correct. You get the... Silence. Yes. Clap. Yes. <laughs> like, it's it's sort of like uh, cheering for the ball getting spiked in a volleyball tournament. Wow. And it's quick. Very quick. And I said to Al, you got to remember, think back, how fast the cheer is here, that we can't depend on that idling scream right. and, you know, and the comedy show. And, you That's got to be weird. Where we get it laughing like, um, you know, I call it Rat Pack style, but it's, it's just where you've made a connection with the audience. And pretty much no matter what you say, as long as it's delivered in the right tone with the right mood is you're a host. Right. The worst that I can be on stage is a host. The best is 
a really funny host. Right. <laughs> or a really smart host. They're there to have fun. You dig? You're there yeah. to help them. Exactly. So the worst, that, the least I can do is be a good host. And that means keep the spirit, you know. Take, you know no, especially if something goes wrong. Oh, my God, the plumbing just exploded. Great. <laughs> 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 then everybody, dude, everybody's instantly, okay, great, it's an right. adventure. You know, as opposed you to, oh, shit. Yeah, no, no, that's that's horrible. Right. You know, oh my God, this is now. This is I don't want to be here. This isn't fun. This is now turning into something other than. That's up to the host. Right. On a good night, if you get everybody kind of humming and bubbling and well fed and and watered and you know, then uh, pretty much anything you say can be. Yeah, it's a little bit funny. Right. And every now and then I hit a moment when I'm just Sammy Davis Lee. <laughs> 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 Did you ever do stand up at all? Boom. Have you ever done just straight stand up? You ever try to do that? Never have. Never have you thought have. of it at all? Yeah, I don't think I have. The, I don't have. A, I ain't got the nerds for it. <laughs> That's crazy <laughs> you know. because you you kind of do it a little on stage. Yes, uh, just a tiny bit, <laughs> enough to sneak up and tap the door and run back. You know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and enough then to immediately hit the music, boys. Hot for teacher. I always have those trap doors built everywhere, <laughs> like Felix the freaking cat. I can draw that door anywhere on thin air and go look a song. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about that fucking brick I just laid out there. Yeah, you guys don't have that door, see? So, my, all of my uh, greatest respects to the job you have chosen. Uh, for me, there's always it doesn't even have to wind up funny. Right, it, right, for right. me, it doesn't even have to wind up clever or anything. Just shut up, Dave. Be the host. When I first met you at the comedy store it was when um you weren't with Van Halen anymore. You were you were on your own then. And uh being back is it's gotta be a trip. I mean, to you guys were separate for so long, they tried two different lead singers. You know, I mean, the Sammy Hagar thing, a lot of people like that. But to me, it wasn't Van Halen. It was like, this is just a whole nother band that Eddie Van Halen's playing guitar in. You can't call this Van Halen. That's crazy. Because the sound was so different. The songs were so different. The tone was so different. It was like, all of a sudden, it was like overweight, drunk girls music. It was like, I didn't I didn't like it. It was... It, it was you know what I'm saying? It, it 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 seemed to me to be like a completely different kind of a band, and then they tried it with the extreme guy. What's his name? I'm taking. Is that a point you're making? What is that dude's name? <laughs> no, his name was the guy that was singer from Extreme. Um, right? Remember? Yes. Um, continue. I'll think of it in a second. And then they go from that. Then then somehow or another, you guys get back together again. Well, that's, you know, the, it's a, like a football movie. <laughs> right. It is. It's kind of crazy. But that's got to be a, a, a really weird feeling to see them have this great success with Sammy Hagar, go out into the world, continue touring, and then that doesn't work out, or they stop that, and then this other guy, and they stop that, and then all of a sudden you're on fucking stage again, and you're, 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 you're Van Halen again, the real Van Halen. Not Van Hagar, the real Van Halen. And the, and the band is booming. Everybody is lucid. Not sober, but lucid. <laughs> That's all you need, right? <laughs> In a court of law, I'll settle for lucid. <laughs> for Van Halen I fans, myself so, am lucid. <laughs> for real Van Halen fans like me, when I heard that you were back with them, it made me so happy. Because I enjoy your solo stuff, and I, I, I enjoy some of their music, even with Sammy Hagar. But it wasn't the same. Together, you guys were like this crazy mixture of all the right ingredients, you know? And those ingredients are from right around the corner. We started talking about, you know, I was in the, I was in the busing program, which was all black and Spanish-speaking classes for junior high, high school, and uh, more importantly, the youth club dance every Friday night or one Friday per month and the all the celebration, you know, the homecoming class dance, etc. For me and my sisters was all black and Spanish speaking. 
When we, when we got graduation, it was uh, they played Santana on a loop, Samba Pati, over and da 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 da. <laughs> wow. Over and over. The Van Halens went to a school, Pasadena High School, which was walking distance from me, but I had to get on that bus. And there was Glal Ridgemont High. That was Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, <laughs> Led Zeppelin. That was the movie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Exactly. Exactly. That uh, that neighborhood. White people. Exactly. So when we got together, you know, first off, they'd say, look at him. He sparkles like a diamond because, you know, I had suspenders and two-tone shoes and as much brill cream in my hair as I could get to hold, you know. And, and uh, that's where the Diamond Dave came from, you know. And... Uh, so when we got together, I said to him, the reason that uh, we're having trouble getting club gigs is it's not girl friendly. You can't dance to the material, you know. You can't play Highway Star by uh, Deep Purple. And that's not dance music. Anything over about 128 beats a minute, you start spilling You're out of your drink. Yeah, you dig. And uh, so if you look back now, jump ahead to all the Van Halen familiars, the Big 15 or whatever we want to call it. Jump, You Really Got Me, uh, Running With The Devil, uh, Dancing. Uh, they're all about 100 to 128 beats a minute. Coincidence? Mm -hmm. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> So you orchestrated it correctly is what you're saying. It was the perfect combination of you getting together with these white people and saying, listen, there's a lot of folks like to dance. Hello. Yes. Well, it was a perfect collision course of this. It wasn't just that. It was it was uh, your voice with his music. It was perfect. You know, it was like you guys were an, an amazing band for a long time. When I was in high school, my sister's boyfriend had Van Halen as his license plate. I forget how he had it to bring it down to the right number, like V-N-H-Y-L-E. Yeah, you know, I don't know how he, he he did it, but everybody was a huge Van Halen freak in my high school. They were always writing those the VH with all the you know, like a political yeah, logo. It was that really? Yeah, it was your yeah. That logo was people would draw that on the back of desks. You would find it on lockers. You know, you've lived a, a that's a, a crazy crazy life, man. It's, it's well, we have a crazy crazy audience, and I've used this crazy band as a passport to go out and visit with, and to you know come and and be part of. My pop spent the last twenty five years of his career. He was a surgeon in working in the prison system, like uh, San Quentin and Folsom and Pelican Bay and all, Ivy League. He called it, and. Um, he used to joke, and he'd say that if you carry a gun to work regularly, then you they know Van Halen. And uh, he meant that on both sides of the bars. <laughs> 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 that when a new Van Halen record came out, that it was celebrated on both sides of the uh, That's of the tier. <laughs> well, you were. What was it like to be a superstar before the internet, too? Well, that's an interesting case because you probably the biggest prayer before you go on stage these days would would be uh, God grant us uh, the powers and the drive and the focus that compelled those before us who did all of this before there was a microphone, before there was a camera taking a picture of what we do. Think about, you know... I, Broadcasting? What what would have been broadcasting? I would have been on a stage with a guitar, but no microphones, no lights, no uh, candles. You got know, candles and no PA system, yeah. right? And not so long ago, during Uncle Manny's life, he's still with us, and I'm sure you know back in the, yeah. in the 1920s and 1930s, you know, they didn't have microphones and stuff. They didn't have uh, guitar amps. Etc. Etc. Yeah, that's what a lot of folks don't understand about the the the, uh, the the phrase upstage when you say stand up stage of them. Um, that means in modern stages are flat, but they used to go. They used to like ramp up, and you used to have to project out into the audience because you you weren't wearing a microphone. Everybody had to be super quiet, and the actor had to talk like this so the whole house could hear them. And that's where that fake style of acting came from. It's like you had to over project or no one could understand you. The upside of not having PA systems, you caused me to, to remember some good story. And is if you, you've heard the term barrel house voice? Yes. Do you never wonder what it's from? It's from a beer hall. 
yeah. one of these, you know, full of beer, beer barrels and everybody. And somebody's having to stand at the end of that hall and sing over the top of that without a PA system. <laughs> you get the big barrel house voices, you know, like Tina Turner maybe has a barrel house voice. Who do we know that has a barrel house voice these days? Anybody particular? You see that that we're not even throwing name after name into the circle here. R. Kelly, perhaps. <laughs> it's got <laughs> barrel house stories. <laughs> yeah, you are, you must be proud of that coming up through these little clubs and, and making your way that way, you know, and having these stories about back in the day when you had no stage and no PA system. Oh yeah, it's the golden years, you yeah. know. It's and you would read about that growing up. You yeah, know, yeah, I didn't yeah. make it up. I right. read about the Beatles, you know, moving together and having to live in broom closets in the Reeperbahn in the red light district of uh, Germany. All right, sold. <laughs> <laughs> did you ex did you explain this to the, did you have to explain this to the rest of the band? Were they all aware of it as well? I don't recollect if this was one of my sell jobs. I, there were <laughs> some things that I had to sell to the band but uh i, I, but I think like, they were aware that this that was special? part of it their father was a traveling professional musician as well so they'd grown up seeing photos of him in in the uh in a on a steamship you know with a porthole the circular porthole in the background and he's having a drink and he's sitting at the piano you know and uh, i had grown up seeing for example pictures of my pop in the air force you know with what 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 is that in the background That's that's Casablanca. Good enough for me. You know? Wow. It's, you know, so when you grow up with that kind of a thing, then uh, you, you sort of know the story. The story is you got to start off in the beer bars. You got to start off in the, in the basements or whatever. One of the best was uh, right around the corner from here on Van Nuys was the Van Nuys Cruise. And throughout the 70s, and I'm going to say at least half of the 60s, um, it was the cruise was probably four miles long, and it would take you over an hour to get from one end to, of the of it to the other. Okay, and all the bike clubs would park uh, on the uh, where the gas stations were closed. Okay, and it was the classic cruise. Um, it went past a place called the Rock Corporation, which looked a lot like where we're inside here with kind of a brick facing inside. A lot of bikers and et cetera used it. And um, this fellow, Ricky Ratchman, who was a VJ for many years with Headbangers Ball. I remember that guy. Yeah. Well, his father was owned the bar at the time okay and his mother and they were both uh in a bike club and they owned and this was a biker's bar okay and it was where they had the first wet t-shirt contest um and this was when they were being tried downtown in the la court systems you know if you got busted for uh running wet t-shirt contests whether it was lewd uh, public exposure you know the usual collision course of you know the mayor versus you know whatever it's probably where the dispensary system is right. today in terms of the legal collision. Well, it's in a gray zone. Well, it isn't. Well, we have a card. Well, it's the wrong card. <laughs> yeah, It's the right card, but the wrong jurisdiction. My same old. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> what episode is this? You know, um, It was in that. And we played those wet t-shirt contests. And uh, you want me to describe? Fuck yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, was, it was all bikers. and um, uh, But I mean, the place held approximately, I'm going to say 400 people. It was, you know, we could pack them in there. And they served Schlitz malt liquor, uh, the bowl, by the uh, pole uh, handle. Do you follow? They had it by draft. the yeah, draft style, style. Style. Yep. They would have it draft style. And it was the only place that served it like that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and they would say, okay, we're going to have wet t-shirt night tonight and they would get everybody in there. And then they would illegally lock the doors. Okay. Throw the bolts on the doors and pull in a kiddie pool and with the kids pool, you know, like <laughs> where you inflate it, you know, the yeah. big giant donuts like this, put it in front of the band. The band's stage was about as tall as I'm going to say a little bit taller than about four feet waist high. I'll say, okay. And, um, I would I would uh, roll my pants up and stand in the pool and uh, interview the girls. 
okay? And the girls would get into the pool, and everybody was real woozy. These were the days of quaaludes and <laughs> uh, disco biscuits and uh, whatever else everybody was doing. No, but nobody, knew what, nobody knew what rehab was. Rehab was something that Uncle Dwayne got sent to if he was up to a quart and a half a day somewhere in Ohio. Rehab. Who knew Betty what the, Ford. You heard about Betty Ford. Not then. even. We're talking about. 1975. Wow. You no know, Betty Ford clinic then? Barely, if there was. I mean, who knew? She barely had pubes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> ni- this was 1974, 5, and 6 in these this area here. And, uh, you know, nobody knew that. It, Jesus, uh, everybody thought that everything done in moderation was, you know, was not a problem. And so everybody did everything at twice the amount of moderation and figured we'd handle the problem later. And it made for really noisy um, carrying on. We would run the girls through, how are you? My name's Tina. Where are you from, Tina? I'm from the Valley. Wow, they like to party in the Valley, don't they? Hey, everybody plays. What song would you like to hear? Well, um, I'd like to hear Free Ride. Al, <laughs> Holly from the Valley wants to take a free ride. do 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 And the band would start to play, you know, the song and whatever. And uh, we'd, and the uh, fellas would step up from behind and they pull our T-shirt really tight and then, you know, dump uh, big pitchers of ice cold water on her. And she'd giggle and, and dance and, you know, carry on and slip and fall in the pool and there'd be water everywhere, etc. cetera. And uh, we'd run them through and there would be t- easily 20 girls, okay? And it was never less than just a total line of hot babes wanting to go through. You would think, who would want to do this? The answer, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) It was the cool thing to do. And uh, all the girls would go through, and then there'd be a huddle over at the side of the uh, stage, and there'd be some secretive talking and some some gesturing and some looking around, and then some further gesturing. And then I would make the obligatory announcement that, ladies and gentlemen, the judges are a little intoxicated, uh, some of the voting slips have been misplaced or mislabeled and then misplaced, and as, as have several of the judges. And we're going to have to have them all go through one more time! <laughs> <laughs> and the band would start playing smoke on the water. <laughs> so we're going to take a break. Don't go away, we'll chase you. That sounds like a hell of a show. Yeah. And what kind of bars are you doing this in? Uh, well, this was a specific bar. This was called the Rock Corporation, and it was uh, off of Van Nuys Boulevard, which is kind of right around the corner from where we're have, broadcasting. Have you been there yeah. lately? It's now just car dealerships, and they don't have the, that drive anymore. It's a little more dangerous. I'm <laughs> sure. Oh, well, I'm sure. You know, this is a, this is a township where, uh, you know, we tear out all the trees and name the street after them. Yeah. So you only did this wet concert at one... <laughs> You only did this wet T-shirt thing at this one particular location. Um, this was the this was the test zone. Uh-huh. Okay, this is where the cops were. Sh- this was the Lenny Bruce place. You follow this? Right. Is the cops were showing up. They were doing undercover. Uh-huh. They were you know getting the inside view on this and eyewitnessing, and then the whole thing was being tested based on what happened here at that one place. Wow! You follow? I think that would be a hell of a show. Can you imagine if you were there when Van Halen first started out doing fucking wet t-shirt contests? Can you imagine what stories you have? Oh, it was great stuff. And we and backstage is when uh, all of our colorful habits started happening. Man, how many times I had to hitchhike home. <laughs> Wouldn't try and remember who had gotten the car. You know. <laughs> when, when, you, when you see yourself and you see all these different guys that have... Uh, been uh contemporaries you know rock stars before you and but you're you're still like living like you're a single man you pack up and go to japan if you want you know you you're not you've never sort of reformulated yourself and brought yourself back into mainstream society you continued just being david lee roth you know (laughs) (laughs) well uh i live in my own little world but leave a message (laughs) (laughs) You know, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of interesting how you pulled it off. You know, like you telling the story about moving to Japan. Like, how many guys get to the point when they're your age that are so unsaddled down and so free that they can just pack up and go to Japan for a year? I got lucky. Yeah, I, I got lucky that, in, in that respect. 
it's because uh, it is a commitment. You know, it's it's a lot like uh, you know I do I talk about you know having read early books about. Uh, well, then I uh, first I joined the Merchant Marines, and I worked my way up to Alaska, and then uh, I had the accident, and uh, so I had to do, go to work in this bar. And I right. was working in this bar when this guy comes in with a treasure map and, <laughs> <laughs> and says, does anybody speak Swahili? He didn't know that I was half Swahili. <laughs> so that's how I wound up in Africa two weeks later. And I just thought it would be fun to be one of those guys. Right. You know? <laughs> but have you always been able to do that? You've always been like the, the type of guy that would just pack up and bolt? Or is this something you've sort of cultivated? I think it's something you have to cultivate. Again, that's pretty astute. You, get, you got a pretty clear eye there, Joan, is that uh, you can't just be impulsive. Yeah, because you'll spend your whole time just mm, getting drunk and you know waking up. But you have an eye for the romantic, though. You have you exactly. Have, yeah. You, you want to paint a more colorful picture. If you're going to be sorted, let's be really sorted. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say it's sorted <laughs> at all. I would. I would say fascinating. You yes. know, I, the idea of packing up and and uh, abandoning everything behind and going somewhere that sounds very appealing to me. I don't know if I would enjoy it the way you're enjoying it, but the way you're enjoying it sounds really interesting. I try to uh, not just wander. I guess that's what I'm pointing at. Right. Is that is I try to make it uh, a full experience so that it's a good story, if nothing else, at the end of the day. You're on an adventure. Yeah. And one of the best things to do is hook up with a team. Get in with a group of people who come from a bunch of different backgrounds and see where that leads you because they're going to have to eat dinner sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed one of them's an alcoholic. Don't look. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> and then just reintegrate yourself. There's a, into there's this a new womanizer in there somewhere. Don't look. <laughs> You'll we'll know. We'll know. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be the one that we ask. Where do you go from that? Uh, and you know, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I've had great luck with that. Does that know? help your songwriting too? Oh, you bet. It must right? Oh yeah, you bet. Um, if. Uh, it, the old the old answer told new is uh, somebody asked me on a show how long he was making fun of me how long does it really take to write a song for Van Halen you know it can't take that long really you know Dave how long does it take to write a song what and I thought out, I, I thought out loud and I said you know what you might have a point let's back uh, back into the truth here a little bit he said if you watch. I'm going to say 1,500 movies, re legitimate movies, from beginning to end. And you discuss them. If you have read, mm, I'm going to say 3,000 magazines. Let's say 3,000 magazines from cover to cover, any kind of magazine. Good. If you've sat in front of television, just generalized television, for another 6,000 hours... It'll take you about 22 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Why, you got a pencil? Yeah. Where's the paper? If you've done all Set that. Set the clock. I can do that. I can beat That's that. Hilarious. I can beat that. How funny is it saying, how funny is it saying how hard could it be to write a Van Halen song? Like, what What a silly bitch that guy is. Because the, the idea that, Anything just because it has a small amount of words, because it has uh, easily uh, rememberable beat or whatever. The idea that it wouldn't be like really hard to fucking create that. And if it wasn't really hard to create that, wouldn't there be a lot more Van Halens out there? That's, there, that's... there there are a number of sub Van Halens out there. <laughs> There's a number of uh, almost Van Halens out there. What do you think was influenced by you guys the most? Like what band? Oh, I can't go nothing. there. Right. You know? <laughs> just, I mean, nothing. It's nothing wrong with being influenced. You know, I don't know. It's what is uh, what does Dave Mamet say that. Uh, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of stealing. Is that what he says? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's well, funny. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't know. I I know what Van what influenced Van Halen the most, 
And that's a whole cross section of different kinds of music and different kinds of theater and different kinds of uh, show business, you know, starting long, long, long ago. You can't just imitate one kind of band. You can't just imitate one kind of music, mm -hmm. you know, or you, or it becomes uh, uh, not even professional wrestlers do that. They update. Look at the way Batman looks, for example, compared to 10 years ago. He yeah. looks different. He's yes. updated. You know it's Batman from across the room. But there's got to be, there's, you know, some I'm updating, we'll call it. I don't even call it improvement. You're not going to really improve Batman. You're just going to kind of, you know, change the silhouette a little bit. Sort you know? of like a lot of people feel like Led Zeppelin did with like a lot of older blues music and, you know, add it to their shit. I don't know what they did to their blues music. I think that, that see, there's the great battle is that, is people that plagiarism. Are, well, yeah. people are saying, is it plagiarism? But yeah. it sounds so different. Most of what they did. Some of it doesn't. <laughs> Some of it sounds like plagiarism. Then let's Bill see Burr. Them. Bill Burr said, <laughs> let's see. <what> <laughs> the, the Jew I think we have just a came case. rocketing out. <laughs> my friend uh, uh, Bill Burr sent me uh, a clip. He goes, this, this broke my heart. He sends me this clip showing Led, Led Zeppelin songs and then all these other people that the Led Zeppelin you know, band apparently got the original music from. It sort of just ganked it, you know, like took chunks of it and. Well, it's interesting when you listen to it back to back because you'll hear um uh, I'm going to try and think of some lyrics, you know, uh, you'll see it says a blues song and then the, all they really got from the blues song was uh, a couple of lyrics. I, I am a little red rooster and uh I lay the golden egg and uh that's what the little red rooster said. Right. And then they'll repeat that a couple of times and they'll say, "Well, that's the little red rooster blues song." He changed all the music. Uh -huh. He went and created something else that was very different musically. So now you have that question of, is that the whole blues song? Is that a tribute? Any... Is that a tribute? Well, I think someone... he owes some money. If he, used, <laughs> if he used the lyrics, if he used the words, right. great, pay him some words money. Yeah. If he changed the music, you changed the music. You changed left behind the music. Well, you were there for the beginning of that debate. You were there in music for the beginning of the sampling debate when it all started happening. When rap artists started like MC Hammer, oh sure, and, and you know Vanilla Ice used that whole beginning part for Under Pressure. I mean, there's so many so many different bands were getting sampled. Like, what was your thought on that when that was all going on? I think if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, use it. Uh, I don't even think you have to acknowledge, you know, acknowledge him behind the scenes. You can pay me for it. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to have it worn right up on the sleeve that you used my material because it's a lot like cooking in the kitchen. You know, you're, you, there are only so many ingredients. If you're going to mix, uh, uh, you want to try and create something that's unfamiliar. I, you know, you understand. So uh -huh. if you're going to take a sample of my voice and mix it with a sample of some other people's voices, great. Then you're going to pay us for that. But I don't think there's anything musically wrong with that. But you just think that it's a financial issue. They owe you a little bit of money from it, but it doesn't bother you. It bothers me from the sense <laughs> that. Uh, well, the song songwriting. When you suffering. lit that cigarette, this motherfucker was waiting with his lighter by his cancer stick, waiting like, yes, the green light from Diamond Dave. There it, I Come am, on, uh, cancer, I, suck it. I, I am the son of Satan, though my my duties now are largely ceremonial. <laughs> Um, so back to that. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's it's. I, I find like mashups. You know, when they take songs like there's a '99 uh, Voodoo Child, '99 Problems, and uh, Jimi Hendrix's Voodoo Child. Sure, it's, it's a great mashup. It's it sounds really awesome. I I think it's great if you're using uh, older familiar music, and I hear it in hip hop a lot, and it's yeah. cool. Yeah, I'm hearing good stuff. They're picking you know good little pieces of music. Great, I'm all for it because otherwise you're going to just have to learn it on an instrument and serve it back up some way anyways when you have a song like uh like mc hammer with the the what was it super freak super yep. freak from rick james where he took that how much does that guy have to give up 
How much does he give up? Does he give up a flat fee? Does he have a, give up a percentage of his sales? How many ways to skin the cat? It depends. It, some people make it a flat fee and say, okay, I'll give it to you for whatever, $10. Other people say, I want a piece of the action, and you're taking a chance because who's in charge of monitoring the action? You know, the record company is right. you know is going to remit. You go, oh, well, I want a little piece of that because that's going to be a popular song. But uh, somewhere in between... You know, there's going to be a licensing fee. It usually comes in terms of just, you know, you got a uh, uh, one check for doing the thing. So, <clears throat> but you, it's, it's a great way for you having uh, older music reinterpreted. Yeah. I'm all for that. Van Halen music's been reinterpreted 35 different ways, you know, and I'm all for that. Um, I, I dig all the floor mixes too. I've heard all kinds of dance remixes yeah. and stuff as well. So, you know, new audiences, new shoes, new cowboy hats. Yeah, you know. nothing wrong with that, right? Oh, it's no. Cool. It's, yeah. it's, well, Van Halen's kind of the spiritual guidance too. Van Halen goes beyond just the musical. <laughs> We're the patron saints of everything that allegedly happens after midnight. You know that. Alleg yeah. Allegedly. That's, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole projection, right? <laughs> well, you were also around to see the music business radically change because of the internet. That had to be quite a bit of a mind fuck because when you guys started, they were selling cassettes. You know, I mean, you guys were albums, were vinyl albums and cassettes, and the vinyl albums were badass because you had the, all the artwork, and then that that shrunk to CDs, and then the CDs went away. And can we say how awesome 1984 was on CD and stereo blasting as loud that that beginning sound like, bam, 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 that was amazing. That was one of my when I was one of my first CDs. Was what, what was it like to to see like this this music business like really fucking change like? Like radically, where you can't really sell records anymore. I mean, you sell a few off of iTunes, but the numbers, the the percentage drop is just staggering. And I think which we're also seeing more than uh, just in terms of numbers, Joe, is that we're seeing uh, how high people are reaching for quality. Because if it's result oriented, we always say, "Well, we're just here for the music. We're just here for the labor of love, etc." But there is a reality behind the scenes that if there's that multi-million dollar ability to sell 20 million records like Saturday Night Fever or uh, one of those Fleetwood Mac records or one of those Eagles records, you know, one of those huge multi-billion selling, Jesus, I, I just I just wrote Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I think I'm going to buy Kahlua with some of the <laughs> profits and really go on vacation <laughs> forever. Yeah. <laughs> One of those kinds of fortunes, you yeah. know. Hey, guys, I just wrote a song called Stairway to Heaven. Oh. And I think. <laughs> Not anymore, right? You know, and, uh, you know, we're going to have to put in a year and a half, two years of our time doing this. You know, that's, that's what happens. You want to do The Wall. You want to do Tommy. You want to do, you know, one of those kinds of records. Then you go, that's like a three-year commitment from the time you go, hey, you want to write some songs? To the time you're standing around uncomfortably in a suit and tie, <laughs> collecting. You. Well, I wouldn't be up here for the ninth time tonight with one of these little statues if it wasn't for a lot of other people. That space of time, <laughs> it's about three years. And it means commit yourself like a blue uniform type of commitment, like ruin your family life more not more often than not. Like you're a soldier for that song. Completely. You become a, you, a soldier in that band. I'm sure Springsteen's acolytes would tell you that, you know, and all those early, you know, Born to Run and Jungle Land and all those epic mm. things do not are not born of, you know, well, yeah, we marched up to the gate and we stormed the gate and won. No, no, no. We had to slog our way <laughs> for Dude, months. The, then we camped for months. <laughs> <laughs> then we decided wrong month. So <laughs> that kind of a thing is like, and, and families take a beating and, you know, well, this, so why would you do it? 
well, first, you, of course, the nobility of song. And second, of course, because you have an opportunity to win the super trizacta, uh, trifecta, whatever it is, race times, uh, you know, a $400 million lotto, you dig, that yeah. will generate forever if you create a bridge over troubled water. But if you're going to be in that studio, it's like going in when it was to a submarine. You may well be there really in mind, if not body, for three full years. And that's before the tour. And when that <laughs> all sort of stopped, what was the feeling like in the music business when it's like all of a sudden electronic downloads are completely taking over? You, you're, you're, companies are getting stripped by illegal downloads, just stripped. Albums are out instantaneously on BitTorrent the moment they're released. And more downloads by in, in terms of how many people are downloading it to how many people are buying it. It far more, far more downloads, right? Well, it's in, you're bringing up interesting thoughts, and you're causing me to have interesting feelings, ambivalent feelings about all of this, because I feel like uh, you, you've come break, you've now broken into the bottom of the boat where they're keeping me. <laughs> <laughs> And you've torn open the door and you have a sword in your hand. <laughs> yeah. Come, Roth, let us fight for freedom. <laughs> because they discovered I was a traitor <laughs> uh, some time ago. Um, you know, uh, I'm coming also from a time, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of uh, not prisoner of Zenda, but uh, whatever that, that other one is where he's on the island. Um, uh, I'm coming from a time when, uh, Count of Monte Cristo, I'm coming from a time when uh, musicians were either loved or not so loved. Van Halen was not so loved. So today, by, who? by the record companies. What? Okay. Yep. And uh, today, if you buy a ten dollar Van Halen record, I'll make six cents royalty. Oh my God! Yes, the producer makes more wow. of those first two records than I do. And um, actually, let me be fair: the subsequent four Van Halen records, I do make eight cents royalty. Wow! Out of a ten dollar record album, there. So. When you're telling me the boat is sinking. <laughs> so you're like, go fuck yourself. Hey, you, you've killed most of my staff. <laughs> really? You're like, I'll be fine. <laughs> Including the big guy with the wristwatch? <laughs> <laughs> the big guy with the wristwatch. <laughs> You killed uh, him, right? Yeah, okay, okay. I, let, I'm prepared to talk. Was it a dark business? <laughs> was it a dark business? Of course it was dark business. Are you kidding? It was as noisy and corrupt as you would ever want it to be. But walking into uh, negotiations for anybody, I don't know that it's any easier today than it ever would be for somebody new. Come on, I write poems for a living, and I sing and dance the poems. It's that simple. But you will spend your whole time trying to perfect that craft if you're going to live off of it um, to try and speak the language of okay now I speak uh, uh, market bearing uh, uh, bonds that uh, equal to uh, prime l lending rate of no no it's all carefully hidden away from you anyways uh -huh. just the idea that you're going to want to sign your own um, your own checks is alien to most people in this business you know so we had to learn the hard way. And when we talk about how the record business has changed, I do miss the epic efforts. People used to make a Herculean effort when you go into the studio to really make a contribution, to really take the music past where you found it, and to really make a million bucks. That's a powerful, uh, that's a powerful uh, energy drink, man. <laughs> <laughs> Nicotine fueled. Ambition and greed times uh, musical uh, whatever. Wow. Do you, you think know? that it'll balance out eventually where the bands will now be able to get free promotion on the internet and then they'll reap most of the profits that come from touring and do you think that eventually that kind of balances out and that what gets distributed on the internet even though you're not getting profit from it like cds 
with new bands, they'll be able it'll be able to change the sort of the atmosphere, and they'll be able to get promotion where they would never be able to get the promotion before, just through viral marketing, just through viral, just friends spreading things that they enjoy. I'm a perfect example of it. I'm if I couldn't get a job today in regular terrestrial radio if my life depended on it. I'm difficult to work with. <laughs> I, I can't imagine that you'd be difficult to work with. Nice. How are you difficult to work with? Anyway, we're back. How are you difficult to work with? You were yourself describing yourself as difficult. How would you be difficult no, this, to work? This, with? this is how I've been labeled. Okay, and getting in and out of regular radio is because I don't fit in. Because I had a black sidekick. Because I play ethnic music loops. I play the the opening from Superfly. Yeah, over but Howard Stern has had Robin Robin Quivers forever. Like. It's different. It's you uh, having a black sidekick was like criticized. Oh yeah, that was a big issue. What? Uh, yeah. Who was your sidekick? His name was Animal. He was one of my. <laughs> he was. Uh, he'd done security <laughs> for uh, you know Dre and Snoop and right? all kinds of good characters. He's from Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, we discussed all kinds of you know uh, pertinent data. We, there was no stone unturned. We discussed right. every subject in the news today. You, you, you know, love so. talking so much. This seems like a perfect thing for you. Well, what they wanted was, hey, but it's for the top of the hour. I'm here for the live. Hey, Tina, what's going on out there? Well, they're getting sucked out of the cards. Right? <laughs> if I was a smart executive, and I know that's uh, an oxymoron. It's like if I, if I was military intelligence, what I would do is I would say, Dave, what do you want to do? Let me get you a microphone and ready, go. We're going to have to throw some commercials in every now and then. Is that okay? Okay. Every, other than that, it's on you. Just completely leave it up to you. But if someone tries to change your personality and try to twist around your, you know, your energy and get you to do something you don't want to do, it's going to be a disaster. Like how they could not see that that would be a disaster like right away is uh, that's that's puzzling to me. Yeah, I think they uh, they were feeling imperious. We had a Tony Soprano. who is is that what it was? They just wanted to get you to listen. <clears throat> yeah, they had. And uh, Corolla was part of this as well. He was one of the other faces that had been hired, and uh, we were all put under the thumb pretty readily. Mm -hmm. It happened quick, and um, I don't think anybody survived it, which is telling. Out of some fourteen different faces and personalities across the country, it was so overmanaged. You know, I mean, Corolla obviously has shown that all he has to do is just be himself. You know, just to put. You know. Now that he's running his own show, it's much more successful than his radio show ever was. You Hello. Know? it's Yeah, it's boom. It's like, let him be him. So now you're doing exactly the same thing. Let you be you. I'm doing uh, the Roth Whatever show, you and want. it's all the same stuff. It's, you know, ethnic music, off color tone, left of center humor. And... Um, I don't know. I don't know a whole lot of guests, so it's kind of a, a monologue, kind of a Mark Twain thing. You know, listen, Bill Burr again, my friend Bill. He, he has money. He calls it the Monday Morning Podcast. He's a stand-up comedian. He just basically rants about shit. He just like pick up the newspaper and just and it's fucking great. It's great. It's an hour of just him talking shit. Almost no guests. Well, you could do that easily. Well, it also we're getting to a level now where talking becomes an art form. And art is something as simple as it wasn't created before, but now that it exists, it forces you to think, forces you to argue, forces you to have some kind of action and reaction kind of thinking. And uh, a lot of folks, when they get to talking on the radio, are afraid of being criticized. You're afraid of losing a constituency, you know, especially when you have morning team radio and mm -hmm. you're doing traditional radio. Um, you know, you don't want to say anything that's going to cause people to argue. And I think that's the first thing that you want to reach for. If you're going to make any kind of contribution, if you say, what is art? Something that forces them to think. Like, what do you mean? Like that soup can. <laughs> <laughs> Like that Andy Warhol soup can from a bazillion years ago. Is that art or is that BS? Is that a sales job or is that right? we're going to be here a while? Get some more, <laughs> some more of that coffee. <laughs> and that's when it becomes art. And and what we're doing here every now and then we hit a moment where if, if the people are listening and people get hooked and. Can I even hear that? Am I supposed to hear that? Am I encouraged to think about that? And 
I think that that's a whole new uh, art form happening out there now. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about letting a person be themselves on a, a television show or on a, a – you're going to spark up again, you fuck. Look at them. You give them the green light. <clears throat> it's uh, it's seeing someone, you know, uh, be able to be themselves for the first time. Be able to express themselves uh, with with no one's direction, you know, with no one telling you what to say or what to do. That's a rare moment. You don't get that on the Tonight Show. You know, when you talk to David Letterman, I get to see David Lee Roth in these five to seven minute bursts where this it's so hard to get to know you like f for real legit. They're going to get to know you, though, if they listen to your radio show. They listen to the Roth show and they re listen to that over and over again for several months. They'll know the real you. Which it's pretty sprawling so far. We've covered a variety of subjects. I like campfire telling. You know, just enough like I can share some things probably you didn't know. Like why disc jockeys on FM radio speak like heroin addicts. <laughs> they don't do that anymore. They gave up. That guy doesn't exist anymore. Remember those guys? Yes. You know, it was that was the uh, alternative to uh, hopping and popping and popping with the best bet for the boss, beat at the top of the pop smash, gold, you know, yeah. timely top 40 uh, boss jock hit bound. Yeah, and then there was the strip club DJ type character. Oh. All right, we got Nickelback <laughs> coming up next. To the stage, candy, candy. $14 <laughs> kamikaze. And he tried to, yeah. try to get as many syllables out of it. <laughs> Lexus to Lexus. the main stage. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a bunch of those voices that they just use, like the sportscaster voice or the, uh, the small town news guy voice. Can you do the, can you do the uh, sportscaster voice? The sportscaster voice would be like, like that, like, like something from The Simpsons. <laughs> Mike Tyson enters the ring, sixteen and zero, two hundred and six pounds, six foot three. I've always wondered what it would be like to announce a fight. Does that uh, come by easily for you? It's um, easy now, yeah, because I've been doing it for so long. It's second nature. But uh, in the beginning, it was a little odd. It was strange, and so it's you. Have, you have to know when to talk, when not to talk, when you're talking too much. You know, it could. You know, you got, you got, and you got to be really focused on what's happening. How did you learn those things? Did you go back and look at tapes of of your call and and listen and get critiqued or? Yeah, I try to be observant while I'm doing it, but definitely had to go back and listen in the early days. And I listen to myself. I go, I need to shut the fuck up. Like I'm talking too much. You know, I or I was talking too much about one fighter and not enough about another. Or I was missing something. Or you know, you can get on tangents sometimes. You can get stuck. It really is like a, a sort of a skill. You learn how to do it as time goes on. I bet it is. And are you watching on the TV screen mostly, or Depends. are you? <laughs> Depends on what the angle is. Like sometimes I, I prefer to see it live, like right in front of me. But sometimes, like especially in ground battles, like when they're they're fighting on the ground, I have to see an overhead. I don't know where the guy's arm is. I don't know if he's in jeopardy or if he's defending correctly. You know, or I could, I could say what he, what he's doing wrong or what he's doing right. I need to see it on the camera sometimes. Or if the guy's backs are to us, some, if their backs are to us, I can't see what's happening in front of them. I can't see where he's hitting them, so I'll look down at a monitor sometimes. It all depends. How many fights have you called? Thou oh, my, my, more than a thousand. <coughs> really? Definitely more than a thousand. Yeah, I've been calling. The, I, I started doing post-fight interviews in 1997 for the UFC, but I started doing the commentary in 2002. So from 2002, 11 years so far. That's amazing. And, yeah. and what one fight really sticks out in your mind? What one night really sticks out in your mind? There's no one that really sticks out because so many of them have been um, insane. The UFC is so fucking exciting. There's so many exciting fights. There's not one that really sticks out. There's, uh, there's so many of them. It's, it's so many, it's so many highs, so many tens, you know. Like, what makes a ten? What makes a ten evening? Like when you walk out at the end of the night and you go, wow, that just all gelled. What, what, what are the three main ingredients, for example? The, whole, the makes... holy shit moments. The holy shit moments. Like when Anderson Silva front kicked Vitor Belfort in the face and knocked him unconscious. You were just like, holy shit. No one had ever landed a front kick to the face ever in a mixed martial arts <laughs> fight. Like, you never saw that. It wasn't well, I, a technique. I spent a lot of my childhood yeah. trying. <laughs> well, it's a, a, you know, a staple technique of karate, of taekwondo, of a lot of martial arts incorporate the front kick. It's a very, like, basic kick. But 
before then, we never saw anybody knock a guy out in the UFC with a front kick to the face. It never happened. There's only been one wheel kick knockout before the Ultimate Fighter. Now there's two. But, the, but before then, there had only been one. Edson Barbosa knocked out Terry Adam with a wheel kick to the face. That had never happened in the UFC before. But the one that landed was unbelievable. Knocked him unconscious. He fell down like he got shot with a sniper rifle. It was craziness. <laughs> it was so devastating that now... People were throwing wheel kicks left and right. Like, everybody's trying to land them because they realize how deadly they are once they land. So now everybody, people pick up the ball and they're going to start to imitate. Exactly. And yeah. you'll start to see the, that, uh, the copycat killers in the ring. Huh? Yeah. Well, you start to see success with these unorthodox techniques that are really not unorthodox techniques. They're just traditional mixed martial arts techniques that people hadn't incorporated into the octagon yet. What, what most of the stuff that got by in the, the early morphing of mixed martial arts was wrestling and uh, the ability to punch on the feet. But then Maury Smith came around and started showing people high-level kickboxing. And he started leg-kicking guys and knocking guys out. So then they started incorporating kicks. But Maurice was a Muay Thai guy. So everybody was throwing like these roundhouse kicks, and that's basically it. Then Anderson sort of evolved things even further, and a lot of other fighters did as well. And now you're starting to see, like with Lyoto Machida and a lot of these other karate stylists, you're starting to see all sorts of different karate techniques inside the octagon as well. Because these guys know all the other stuff, like wrestling. They know how to stand up with wrestling. They know how to get back up to their feet, and they know how to avoid takedowns. So now you're seeing all these other traditional mixed martial arts techniques, or traditional uh, martial arts techniques, rather, that we didn't see for 10-plus years. And are these familiar techniques that uh, are we going to continue seeing them, oh, or yeah, are they particular yeah, to one guy? Well, there's a few that we haven't seen yet. One of them is the axe kick. Guys have tried it, but no one's ever knocked anybody out. In kickboxing and in Taekwondo tournaments, there's a lot of knockouts with axe kicks. I've never seen one in the UFC. And an axe kick with a guy with your kind of flexibility, when you used to throw those wild kicks, when you would basically do a split standing up and throw a kick like right over your head, you know the axe kick is you throw the leg up like that and then you come down with the heel. It's a devastating technique if you're flexible enough and you're fast enough. It's like getting hit in the head with a, a, a giant bone hammer, you know? I mean, it's really a brutal technique, but we haven't seen it in the octagon How yet. come we haven't seen it in the octagon? For I'm the just... same reason why Anderson Silva's front kick to Vitor Belfort's face was the first time we ever saw it. We just need to see someone pull it off. If one person pulled it off, one guy who really knows how to do it and has confidence in it, we'll see it left and right. It's sort of like the four-minute mile. Once it's broken, then other people will break it. <laughs> what about the biggest, biggest guys? Who are, who are the two biggest guys now that are fighting in there? Well, the, that's the funny thing about heavyweights. It doesn't seem that the biggest guys are the most effective. In heavyweights, once you get up to 265 pounds, that's the heavyweight limit. The most effective guys seem to be about 240, like Cain Velasquez, Junior Dos Santos. Those guys are around 240. When you get bigger than that, you just move a little too slow, and you don't make up in horsepower what you what you get what what you lose rather with your your having too much muscle mass, having your body uh, have to pump blood through too much body mass, too many cells to feed with oxygen. It seems like there's a point of diminishing returns. And, and they move seems, slower. It's not as much fun to watch the fight. Yeah. Well, they move slower. They're easier to hit as well. They're easier to hit, and they can't keep up the pace. Like. A 155-pound fighter, like you see a lightweight in the UFC, they can, they can blitz for five five-minute rounds. Like Benson Henderson, the lightweight champ, that dude can go full clip for five five-minute rounds. He's got that cardio. No heavyweight does. They just don't. They just don't have it. Even Cain Velasquez, who's the most conditioned heavyweight, he'll get more tired in a five-round fight, like when he just won the title back against Junior Dos Santos. He's known for his cardio, but he got noticeably tired in, in, in that fight. Even though he dominated and, and won his title back, he got way more tired than you would ever see like Benson Henderson get. And it's just a matter of physics. It's just a matter of you have to pump oxygen and blood through you're dealing with 90 more pounds of tissue than Benson has to deal with. We're talking endurance is probably how much percentage of the winning it's combination? Enormous. It's enormous. For every fight that 80, gets out 80 of the round. 80%? For every fight that gets out of the first round, it becomes a bigger and bigger, uh, a bigger, and bigger part of the equation. But you don't see any fighters that are successful in the top 10 under 265 pounds that have stamina issues. They never make it. You just can't make it. 
You can't make it at 170 with stamina issues. You know, George St. Pierre is a cardio machine. 155, Benson Henderson is a cardio machine. 185, Anderson Silva never gets tired. Anderson Silva got throttled by Chael Sonnen for four and a half rounds and still pulled off a triangle off of his back in the fifth round. I mean, you're talking about a guy with supreme conditioning. And those are the only guys that survive in this day. There's, the, the field is far too competitive. There's no way to make it unless you have all the bases covered. You'll get a certain f- distance with just power if you're like a really explosive guy who can just blitz guys and run after them and crack them. You'll get a certain distance, but you'll never beat the very best guys because the very best guys will know. They'll have to do is run you, just sprint you for the first 45 minutes and if, or 45 seconds rather. And if you don't if you don't catch them with a shot, then your your gas tanks are already empty. You're I, taxed I remember when this was all just starting off and it was all very iffy as to where it could be shown yeah. and what cities would allow it to happen and now what we got two women who are fighting yeah and, and and how did this just go how did it was great it yeah was a great fight too it wasn't it wasn't like she went in there and kicked the girl's ass like the girl almost got her. liz carmouche was the the opponent and uh, liz carmouche took her back and you know she's a marine and a lesbian you know you're talking about a, <laughs> she's a badass bitch and she wasn't there to lose she was there to win and she took ronda rousey's back and uh, had her in a standing rear naked choke it was bad her face was twisted ronda's face was bright a purple female Marine lesbian yeah, yeah. It, with a standing rear naked choke. Yeah, I have that video. <laughs> <laughs> you can't travel with that one. If you go overseas, they arrest you. It was. It uh, sounds great, it frankly. Was a, it was a wild fight. And how long did the fight go on? First round, and uh, Ronda got out of the rear naked choke, got her to the ground, and got her in an arm bar. So she's won seven fights, seven first round arm bars. She's a badass bitch too. It was a great fight. It was incredible. It was beautiful to watch. Where where, where did they have this? Uh, Anaheim. Show? This was in Anaheim. And, how, and was it pretty well attended? Oh yeah, yeah. People it was sold out. It was craziness. Yeah. This is excellent. Yeah. What's what's this say about uh, the economy? That uh, the economy <laughs> is falling apart, but that this is thriving. Well, there's this, so... is, this is an element of sports and showbiz that is just thriving. Even yeah. if the economy is in the toilet, which it most certainly is, there's so many people. I mean, we, we're dealing with 20 million people. Only 15,000 can go to this thing. You know, even in a downed economy, you're going to find 15,000 people who can scrape together the cash for such an epic event, especially women who are, like, really into the UFC, and now all of a sudden they have someone who's, like, a role model for them. Like, you know how many girls are going to start doing martial arts now because of oh, Ronda sure. Rousey and Liz Carmouche? Yeah. I'm sure of it. Fuck I'm yeah. I'm sure of it. It's going to be amazing. They'll start seeing the placards in the storefront windows. Yeah. Uh, Starting now, women's classes, women's only classes. Yeah, you know? yeah, no, no doubt about it. There's going to be a lot more of that. And now that they realize, also, you can make a legit living. Like Ronda Rousey, if she's not rich already from that fight, which I'm pretty sure she is, and I don't know how much she makes off of pay per view and all that jazz, but I'm sure she probably has more money than her wildest dreams right now. And that's the beginning. That girl is a superstar in athletics now. I mean, she's doing every possible talk show. She's doing every possible magazine interview. Five years from now, she'll be able to retire and, and buy herself a fucking country somewhere and have a bunch of little brown dudes wash her feet. <laughs> she'll be able to do whatever she wants. She can't, she can't do ro- any wrong, you know? She's a beast. Are, are, are these gals tested for oh, yes. steroids and, yeah, and whatnot? Well, How far has that come reaching in a Lance uh, Armstrong kind of world? Well, that's what? a very good point. Her main um, threat out there is a chick that calls herself Cyborg, and she got popped for steroids, and she looks like a man. She's built like – pull up a picture of Cyborg so you can see a picture of her, Chris Cyborg. She's, uh, she also says that she can't drop down to 135 pounds, which is where Ronda's the champ. She wants Ronda to come up and fight her at 145 because she weighs even more than that. She cuts weight to get down there. And a lot of people speculate that she just wants to stay on the juice and stay as, as thick and meaty as possible. Look at the size of this beast. And that's, she's a that's, ser- and that's she's, that's cyborg. That's cyborg. Yeah. There's a picture of her in the, inside the cage that's even scarier. Um, there's a picture of her beating up a chick, and she's just swole like a dude. And she's very skilled as well. It's not just that she's, you know, uh, really physically strong. She's also, I think she won the world championships as a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. She's a, a devastating uh, stand-up fighter, really good kickboxing skill. 
And, but are are the athletes tested for steroids? Yeah, and... she didn't. She didn't pass. She got an F. <laughs> <laughs> she looks like a dude, and she got an F. Well, that's you know, I'm, you know, I'm I'm I don't know how uh, politically incorrect or correct I can be here, but that's kind of how I like it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you? you like a little chaos. Yeah, in the there's, mix? yeah, there's, a, there's some yeah. dirt under the fingernails happening. There. Look at her there. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is some masculine characteristics. Yeah, that's somebody who's been doing heavy lifting. Yeah, with a dick growing in their panties. I uh, have a. <laughs> I'm spotting penis. I have a good friend who's uh, also a doctor, and he's uh, he specializes in hormones and hormone therapy, and and the reactions that people have to uh, certain hormones. And he he got on our show and said there is not a way in the world that a woman gets built like that unless she's taking male hormones. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, yeah it, it would like, have to be. He's you're talking about like ridiculously thick musculature in strange places like the traps and the neck and the shoulders and the arms. Like you're talking about literally man-sized athlete, a, a good strong male athlete's body. Well, this brings up another question then, and this goes into normal boxing. Do they test for steroids, etc., oh, yeah. in traditional boxing? Oh, yes, they do. Yeah, people have been caught. Absolutely. Because uh, somebody was just talking about it on the air recently, that if uh, athletes are buffing up all the more and still throwing punches at each other's heads, then the injuries and the damage is going to be considerably more just because everybody's stronger. Everybody's yeah. got more wallop, yeah? Yeah, that is the big, that's the big debate. Also, the ability to keep punching and not get tired. There's other things that are just as dangerous as steroids, like EPO. EPO is what Lance Armstrong was using, what all those cyclists use. And what it does is it gives your body an extraordinary amount of red blood cells, allows you to carry oxygen in a really unnatural manner. And what these guys are doing is they, if they're taking EPO and they're fighting someone, they put a pace on a guy. Like they can go, they have way more endurance than is like like normally physically possible. And they'll put a pace on a guy and then wind up beating the shit out of the guy because the guy can't keep up with their pace. Well, is it because they've trained harder or is it because they're on EPO? Well, it could be both, but the EPO most certainly is a dangerous aspect of fighting. You're what What is EPO exactly? I don't know. Let me pull up what, the, um, what, what it stands for. But what it is is, and I have a friend who has used this stuff because he was a former um, uh, professional cycler. And uh, he said that when he was on, uh, he was on a, a, like a big cycling team. He said they were on the bus, they were on tour. You would hear guys get up in the middle of the night and grab their bike and hear them pull their bike off the bus and go for a ride. They had to because the, the blood was pooling up in their body. Their body is producing so much red blood cells. You literally have to go out and burn some of it off. He said it was pretty crazy and dangerous stuff. It's called erythropoietin. <laughs> erythropoietin. Um, I'll spell it. Yeah, well, it's E R Y T H R O P O I E T I N. Erythropoietin. Irregardless. So what did they do? Erythropoietin. This is something you just take as an injectable, and yes. then it creates red blood cells. Yes, I'll, I'll give you. It's okay. It's a glycoprotein hormone that controls erythropoiesis or red blood cell production. It's a cytokine protein signaling monocle, uh, molecule, um, and the precursors in the bone marrow, and human EPO is a molecular weight of 34,000. But is, it, is this legal for, no. for any sport at all? No, it is not, but it's not te it wasn't, as far as really recently, tested for in fighting. Um, in uh, the uh, UFC, what they weren't testing it for the Nevada State Athletic Commission. They weren't testing it for boxers. But then um, some boxer, I believe it was Sugar Shane Mosley, got caught for it. <laughs> yeah. He got caught for something else it's too. A stellar crew. <laughs> well, you know, look, these guys are their their health is on the line when they're fighting. You know, I mean, you got to think if you have a little more endurance, if you have a little more strength, it could keep you from getting knocked out. It could keep you from getting beaten. It could sure certainly m make your odds of success much higher. And so a lot of guys, I think, even though it is cheating, they look at it pragmatically and then they look at the fact that, look, most of these guys are taking things, including Floyd Mayweather, who always is going off about people being, um, you know, on drugs and all these different things. Yep. But it turns out he had accidentally ingested some performance enhancing substance <laughs> and made some sort of a deal to keep all that quiet. 
<laughs> yeah, he these, accidentally ingested uh, that. Huh? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly if you want to know. It's, it's in a cold medicine. <laughs> clearly, yeah. Well, there's there's accidental um, uh, there's accidental consumption through supplements that you buy, like GNC. Sure. A lot of times they actually have supplements that you're buying that actually have steroids in them. Like Brian was we on this show, he's reviewed all these dick pills. You know those dick pills that you get at a gas station. Sure. You see them. A lot of them, a good percentage of them, are actually like either Cialis or Viagra. They buy it in bulk form, and it's actually cheap to sell. And you mix it up with some fucking wacky herbs, and you sell it over the counter in these gas stations that do not give a fuck. These 24-hour gas stations in the middle of nowhere, they'll sell these things, and it's profitable and really effective because they actually do work. Well, they do do that with steroids. Like there have been many supplement companies that have been caught – and it turns out that like athletes took their stuff and then tested positive for steroids, and then they'll take that stuff and they'll bring it to a lab and they go, yeah, there's steroids in there. Like they they have illegally poured gotcha. steroids into okay. their supplements to make them effective. So Floyd Mayweather uh, performance enhancing drug test. Well, that used to happen all the time with Sudafed and this sort of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it used to happen with Sudafed. Yeah, Floyd Mayweather got caught. Uh, what did he get? Tested positive three times for PEDs. They they don't have listed what he uh, what he took, <laughs> but it's hilarious. <laughs> a lot of those guys are on things. A, a, a good high percentage. And if they're not on that, you know what they are on. Almost everyone is taking supplements, whether it's uh, creatine or protein or vitamins or you know whatever beta alanine, whatever like legal stuff. Uh, and you acids. see that making a big difference in the ring, it's for not, example. Not maybe not a big difference, but a difference. And certainly um, there's stuff that you can take. Cordyceps mushrooms has a, a, a very profound effect on endurance. Um, that's real. That's legit. I've taken that stuff. There's a product called Shroom Tech Sport that my company actually sells that is it's it's based on the cordyceps mushroom there's stuff that you can take that does work and and how much and how much how, how does it register for you how do can you tell that you get a little burst of energy or yeah just tell like i normally uh will be at a, a certain level of exhaustion to work out but i'll feel like i have extra energy because of taking this stuff there's also b12 in it which has definitely been shown to be effective so the you factor all that stuff in like b12 which a lot of like athletes will take in injectable form before performance because it, it enhances your, your, your energy and your ability to sustain energy. But B12 is legal. So all these things, it's, it becomes a matter of like if you throw in a cocktail of all these l- legal things that can enhance performance that you're allowed to do, how much of a bump does it give you? Does it give you a 5% bump? It might be a 10% bump. It might, I mean, at what point is it performance enhancing? Well, when you take a steroid and it gets to 50%, is that where everybody draws the line? I don't know. It's it's, it's going to be a strange day when a regular person is more fit and and more more capable than professional athletes who are natural because a regular person is going to have gone in for gene therapy the way a girl goes in for a <laughs> nose job today because that's that's going to happen. It's yep. just going to. If the, if the human race stays alive, if we don't get hit in the head by a meteor, if we don't blow ourselves up, there's going to come a point in time within the next couple of decades where you're going to be able to change the molecular structure of your body. You're going to be able to reformulate how your body is shaped. You're going to change your genetics. You're going to change uh, all sorts of aspects of the way your body performs. And regular people are going to be able to get it. Just like a regular person now has in their pocket, in the cell phone, a, a, a computer processor that's greater than the computer processor that they used in the Apollo 11 moon land launch it's we 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 have now it's like we have nuttiness in our pocket and and we use it for what <laughs> whatever the fuck you want but it's like in that 50 years you know from from you know 1960 whenever it was to now imagine that amount of time going by from now into the future i can't Imagine a time where we're not doing some sort of crazy genetic experiment. Not particularly of, from this moment on. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine happen. it. It's got. It's got to be happening in secret too. Yeah. Behind closed doors. Yeah, There's some, a conspiracy. Some somewhere. Planet of the Apes type shit. That's what we got to look out for. <laughs> to make some hybrid human chimpanzee murderers. Like some soylent green shit. You just drop That's them off in Russia. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's possible. 
crazy fucks. I mean, when you think about what what we do if we send troops to another country. You know, what you're doing is you're guaranteeing that someone over there is going to die, right? You're, you're you're definitely doing that. If you could train uh, some sort of a chimpanzee that you've created in a laboratory and f- teach them how to how to shoot a gun and send them over there and tell them to eat babies and shoot people. You don't think they would do it? Joe, what do you think about that tranny that's uh, yes. trying to fight in the MMA? I was going to bring that up. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's... How did you get from a baby-eating cannibal <laughs> monkey? It's magic yeah. babies, I think. Penis. There's uh, a – well, she calls herself a woman, but I tend to disagree. And uh, she um, she used to be a man, but now she has had – she's a transgender, which is an official term that means you've gone through it, right? And uh, she wants to be able to fight women in uh, in MMA. I say no fucking way. I say if you had a dick at one point in time, you also have all the bone structure that comes with having a dick. You have bigger hands. You have bigger shoulder joints. You're a fucking man. And there, that's her right there. That's a man. How's it going, okay. Guys? You can't have. That's. I don't care if you don't have a dick anymore. Yeah, that looks can't. like that looks like a guy's carriage there, right? Yeah, you can't fight women. That's fucking crazy. I don't know why she thinks that she's going to be able to do that. You, if you want to be uh, a woman in the bedroom and you know you want to play house and all that other shit, and you know you feel like you have a your your body is really a, a woman's body trapped inside a man's frame, and so you got an operation. That's all good in the hood, but what you can't fight chicks. Get the fuck out of here. You're out of your mind. You need to fight men. You know, period. You need to fight men your size because you're a man. You're a man without a dick. And I don't know what that dude next to you on the left, I don't know what the fuck he's trying to convince himself of. I don't know what he's saying right now. I don't need to hear it. I'm looking at a man with a dress. Okay? And you don't, you could act as a woman. I will call you a her. I will uh, treat, I will call you ma'am. I'll be respectful. But you can't fight women when you have a man's frame. Period. Yeah. Women aren't that wide. That generates to increase punching power. Women don't have that sort of muscle structure. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know. You mean, obviously, if you're trans-operational, it means you remove your testicles so your body's not pr- producing testosterone anymore. I don't know if you're supplementing testosterone. Why, if, you haven't, if your body's not producing testosterone, why are your arms so big? What's going on here? You know, there's a, there's a lot of shit going on there, and you, you can't fight women. No fucking way. Yeah, I agree with that. You but know, that, she's that, fighting look, women. That, yeah, that looks like a guy. That's a guy's carriage there. Well, not only that, she's won two fights by brutal knockout. So she's fighting and, and, women. And whose who's divisions, who's, uh, whose fight game is she participating in? The, exactly. There's a variety, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, is there's there a variety of small companies that... Um, that are uh, willing to uh, allow a person like this to fight. I say it's fucked up. You you can't fight women. You can't. And they're just to look at her record, she's crushed two women inside the first round. I mean, she's she she's crushing these girls. How, what is the what is her weight? One forty five. She knocked out this chick in thirty nine seconds with a vicious knee to the head. A she man, looks she looks like she's really in shape there. Yeah. Look, she's huge. She's not just huge. She's got a fucking man's face. I mean, you can wear all the lipstick you want. You know, you want to be a woman and you want to take female hormones. You want to get a boob job. That's all fine. I, I support your life to live, your right to live as a woman. What about her fighting uh, guys then? Fight guys. Yes. Yeah. We, she has to fight guys. It's yeah. not, first of all, she's not really a she. She's a transgender uh, post-op person. So she's supposedly after the operation. Yeah. The operation doesn't shave down your bone density. It doesn't change. You look at a man's hands and you look at a woman's hands, and they're they're built different. They're just thicker. They're stronger. Your wrists are thicker. Your elbows are thicker. Your joints are thicker. The the just the mechanical function of punching that a man can do it much harder than a woman can. Period. Well, he looks also like he's been doing uh, athletics since yeah. he was nothing years old. You don't just start uh, boxing and then that's what you look like. And yeah. uh, I got to imagine there's a lot of 
female fighters out there who are relatively new to the game yeah. within the last five summers. And I am I support 100% anyone's right to be transgender. This is not where it lies with me. Like, I'm not a prejudiced person. I don't know what you feel in your body. I don't know if you really are a woman trapped in a man's body. I support your right to do whatever you want to do. Go for it. If that's what makes you happy, I, I would not try to stop that at all, and I support it 100%. The real issue comes with violent competition with women and the reality of the physical structure of your body. The reality of the physical, physical structure is not fair. You can't say that a 145-pound woman and a 145-pound man are even. That's like saying uh, a 30-pound you know, poodle and a 30-pound pit bull are just two dogs. Because they're not. One of them has distributed its mass in a quite a different way. It's built for quite a different purpose. And men are built for smashing shit. Women, women are built for getting held down and, uh, by the stronger male monkey. And, you know, and women are, are, are built for carrying babies and doing work and whatever other non-hyper-explosive physical things you would want to do with your body. But they're not built for hyper-explosive physical violence. They're just not. That's they have more dainty frames. Their hands are smaller. And even if they are big, they're not big like a big man is. It's not fair. And it's not I'm not trying to discriminate against women in any way, shape or form. And I'm a big supporter of women's fighting. I, I loved watching that Ronda Rousey, Liz Carmouche, Carmouche fight. But those are actual women. Those are actual women. And as strong as Ronda Rousey looks, she still looks to me like a, a pretty girl. She's a beautiful girl who happens to be strong. There's, she's a girl. This is not a girl. Okay, this is a transgender woman. And, and it's this, a totally and, different and this, specification. And this invites right away some of the usual stuff that haunts this kind of thing, like women's bodybuilding right. or women's boxing, uh -huh. women's fighting. Or, or how about some crazy dude who wants to beat the fuck out of chick so he gets his dick chopped off? I mean, that's not outside the realm of possibility. There's a lot of suicidal fucks out there. There's a lot of people that are, like, on the edge. Anyway, like, getting your dick chopped off, you know you're going to pay attention to me? Okay, I'll chop my dick off. I'll be a girl for a while. Like, there, there's people out there that are fucking crazy, and you can't let them fight girls. You just I agree. can't. I agree. And is she trying to get into the real uh, the real fight game? Well, she... yes. She, well, she's doing – she's in the, the CFA, which is a, a, a smaller but legit organization. I've, I've heard of this organization, and uh, I think sh they actually um, broadcast on – sometimes they broadcast on, uh, on cable television. So you can watch this fight. Um, the CFA is a – you know, they're, they're a legit, like, farm organization, I would say, or a B organization that has talented fighters, guys that are coming up. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good organization. I just don't – I don't agree with the Athletic Commission letting this happen. Is the I Athletic Commission letting something happen? I don't know. It either is that or they're doing these things on Indian grounds. If they do them in Indian reservations, which uh, we used to do all the old uh, MMA fights, like the King of the Cage, we used to have to go to watch those at an Indian reservation. We used to go way out in the middle of nowhere. A lot of them even took place outdoors. And those days, are, uh, the, you still can see... In places that don't have sanctioning, you still can see MMA fights at Indian reservations that go by like really wacky rules. Like you wear shoes, and you know this guy hasn't trained at all, and this guy's had forty-five fights, and you know th those mismatches and stuff. Those can still take place because they don't have athletic commissions. Gotcha. They might have athletic commissions. They also might have a bunch of people that are on steroids and nobody testing. Like you don't really know what you're going to get because they're their own sort of sovereign nation. You know, when you're on Indian uh, land, if you are on Native American land, when you're on a reservation, they essentially can make their own athletic commission. Even if it's illegal in California, they were still holding fights in King of the Cage all throughout that illegal time. All of it was being done on Indian reservations. Why on, why on Indian reservations? Just because it's a sovereign state? Yeah. It's, it's, it's own country? They can do country, whatever the fuck or... they want. That's how they have casinos. You know, it's like... Why when... is prostitution legal then on that? You I don't think, think they, they want that. I don't think they want that. Uh, there's not see, one crazy Indian out there that has a boner? He's got his crazy. own hookers. <laughs> he's got his own stable. Those guys have so much money, too. I mean, but basically what happened was, you know, the United States or, you know, the founding humans that traveled across the United States when they like essentially caused genocide on the North American, their Native American uh, Indian population, they, what they did was they granted them some patches of land, you know, these reservations. They, they fucked them over. They got smaller and smaller over the years, but 
some of them still remained into the 20th century. And that's when these guys said, well, this is our land, right? We have our own little nation. What about a casino? And, and uh, yeah, I guess you could do whatever you want. So, boom, Foxwoods, all these different places where it was illegal to have casinos got tremendous success just p putting casinos on these Indian lands. I remember. Yeah. So if this chick fights on Indian land, I guess she can do – they could do whatever you want. I don't see the Nevada State Athletic Commission allowing a woman to fight a man, though. Even a, transgen a transgender woman is no, still well, that she, it's, she, it's so well known that yeah. – uh, no, she, she's not going to. There's a 50-year-old guy that is um, in high school or, or in uh, college, rather, playing women's basketball. He's 50. He's like six foot fucking something or another. This guy's uh, – he's six foot six, okay? And he's 230 pounds. He's a, a giant motherfucker. And he's playing competitive basketball in these 18 to 20-year-old women. So he's in college, <laughs> he's 50, he's got his dick hacked off, so he's a woman now. Oh, really? Yes. So he's a transgender woman competing against 18 to 20-year-old college girls, actual normal college and girls. And is he beating them? Of course he is. He's fucking enormous. These chicks are like five foot one and shit. He's 6'6", six, six, 230 and there, and there's pounds. there's nothing that anybody can say? <sighs> I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't know why anybody would ever allow that. When it comes to competitive athletics, that's where you got to draw the line. You're allowed to wear makeup. You're allowed to say your name is Shirley. You're allowed to do whatever. This is the guy. Look at it. See? I mean, what the fuck, man? Look at the giant hands on this woman. You would ne that's not a woman. That's a nightmare. That's, that's you, you sort of sober up, and you realize this guy's in your kitchen going, come on, let's go in the bedroom. Oh. And you're like, wait a minute, what? Put How did I get penis, here? Put your penis inside of my penis. You're like, what's going on? <laughs> what is, that's, that's a nightmare. And there's another photo of her actually playing basketball like with the women, and it's so scary because she's so much bigger than the women. That's where there's a reason why women play basketball. Oh, there yeah, you go. look at that, oh, man. That's ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous. There's a reason why women play with women. It's because it's a <laughs> fucking sport, and they're the same size. And no woman would ever get this tattoo of Barb fence with a what is that a wolf it's like a lightning bolt with a <laughs> shrunken head what is that it's a it's it, like what, a shrunken head that barbed wire thing yeah what is that monster face it looks like a wolf it's a wolf it yeah. is a wolf no, isn't it no chick's gonna get a wolf and barbed oh wire my right God. Around. what a crazy <laughs> fuck on both arms it looks like yeah well two wolves the third one's on her tits <laughs> Yeah, That's does she have correct. fake tits? Who allows that? <laughs> Why would they allow that? Someone at How Mission did... College, you know? It's the, the, the Mission College which is in Fremont, California. Um, I don't know how this is allowed. I don't know how it happened. Uh, they call her Gabby. I don't know. And, and is Gabby winning? Because if Gabby's winning, then you got an issue. If It's easier if they're not yeah. winning. Well, yeah. she, before she was Gabby, her name was Robert John Ludwig. Jesus Christ! That's... What the fuck? And not only that... He's fucking 50. Wow. I mean, what a crazy old fuck. Yeah, what's he doing in college? At the well, he probably always wanted to be a girl and uh, always wanted to uh, relive his life as a girl. So he's going back to college. And I don't know if there's like age restrictions for competitive sports in all colleges. I mean, I, I think it's Clearly some... there isn't. I guess not. With this, Clearly there <laughs> This school's... However, this school At the age it. of 50? Come on. Yeah. They don't um, care if you can keep up with the team. You used to train at uh, Benny the Jet Center in California. Yes. Before, didn't you? Yeah, a number of years ago. How do you know that? I just started out there when I first came to California. But they closed the place down because of the... Uh, I came right after the earthquakes. Uh -huh. But when the earthquakes... After everything settled down, there was so much roof damage that that place, when it rained in the winter just got fucked and so they had to get out of there so i was only there for you know as many months as it took before it started raining around here again and they realized how bad the damage really was in the roof and then they moved to north hollywood and i, I trained there for a little while but uh, it's just outside of my uh my distance where do you train now are you still training you yeah get boxing I, or? I have a disc issue in my back so i haven't been doing any jujitsu for a few months i've uh -huh. just been doing kickboxing i have a bulging disc Sure enough. Mm. And what, does that bother you most time, more times than not? More in jiu-jitsu than in anything else. I'm uh, able to kick and punch and lift weights, do a lot of things, but getting my neck yanked on 
that's when it becomes a problem. Like when someone is trying to submit me or pull down on my neck, it places a lot of pressure and it can pinch the nerves. Sure can, enough. real painful. Yeah, that disc is always the jujitsu key out of there. Yeah. Huh? That's the that's what always uh, catches up from that art form there. Discs, definitely. Yeah, a lot of guys have disc issues. Uh, Ricardo Laborio scared the shit out of me. He's a famous jujitsu guy. He told me he has seven herniated discs. I was like, seven? How and, many of them are there? Yeah. and you know, was, Seven of them that are bulging out and pinching against nerves? Yeah, they're pinching and he's walking? Yep. So yeah, is he in pain? Oh, is he yeah. always in pain? Always in pain. Yeah, he's always in pain. And he doesn't compete anymore either. He's a trainer. He still rolls with guys, but he's not uh, He's not competing anymore. He was a, a very high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu competitor at one point in time and then became the coach, one of the head coaches at uh, American Top Team. But, like, his back is fucked. This guy's... Yeah, how do you even get that fixed? That that well, many discs? I don't you think you can, can. slowly but surely. There's there's ways to do it. And one of the things that they're doing now is they're actually replacing the discs with an artificial disc. And uh, they screw it in place. It's like a plastic spacer. I've seen um, them in person because uh, one of the first guys to ever get it done to start competing again was a guy named Nate Quarry. And uh, Nate has uh, these spacers where they, they take out your disc and they screw this thing into the bone. And it's like rigid in place where your disc used to be. And it kind of gives a little. It's made out of like this plastic substance. And is he able to roll? Is he still uh, able to fight? fought and... four times with an artificial disc. Yeah, he's had one artificial disc. And I think he has two of his discs in his next fused. Yeah, it's craziness, man. <laughs> That's a high price to pay. It's huh? not one guy either. What's scaring the shit out of me is that before I was having back problems, I heard about guys getting injured. I heard about guys getting surgery. I know Tito Ortiz had two surgeries like that. He has a spacer in his back as well as a fused disc in his neck. But I didn't think about it in terms of like the overall sport until I got my own injury. And then I started asking all sorts of people, like trainers. and how many? Do you have any problems with your back? Yeah, I got three herniated discs. Like, what? Like, Everybody has them. You know, the disc the disc issue is a real issue. Yep. Scary stuff. It is. And, Numb uh, arms and stuff. Sure. And uh, it's the one ticket that uh, very few people do talk about, huh? Yeah, it's a problem. I, I think it's a career changer. Is if you know when your back gets involved, you yeah. know, I have lower back issues do you? for many years. Yeah, you bet. Do you do yoga? Um, yeah, but usually that's not the ticket to uh, you know just Is helping as, you. No, nah. It's uh, usually it's a matter of strengthening that whole area, that mm. whole wrap around where your hips are, and mm -hmm. getting good strong muscle and all the you know sit ups and back ups and all in that area there because stretching it is kind of what pops them out. Mm. You know? Well. Uh, yes and no. Um, the, the strengthening is very important. You're absolutely right about that. But one thing that you can do by stretching and by a lot of yoga exercise is you, you're sort of elongating your spine. You can actually help relieve some of the compression that just comes from gravity and poor posture. And you can actually strengthen good posture with a lot of the yoga poses. Yoga has been very helpful for me while, while I've been going through this. And a good, strong, like, yoga session alleviates a lot of stress in my back. I feel like a lot of tension relaxed. It feels much, much better. What kind of yoga are you doing? I do a little of that hot yoga. Yeah? Yeah, a little Bikrams. I do a bunch of different kinds. In the room the where they turn the heat up a lot? I like that. I do it at home by myself, too. I have some DVDs that I follow. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, stretching is very, very important. You know, you probably are the most flexible rock star in the history of the world. What do you say? Well, yeah. I do. <laughs> I do a lot of. Uh, before it was yoga, we used to call it stretching. Yeah. <laughs> Who else can throw those crazy kicks? I mean, you as a, as a way of life, you yeah. know, staring at a little piece of floor and holding the position. Well, when I was a Taekwondo competitor in my high school years, and I was a huge Van Halen fan, I, I always took pride in the fact that David Lee Roth can throw some fucking kicks. There you go. Like, you you can throw some legit shit, and then I was like, oh shit, he trains the jet center yep like the jet center for kickboxers was like back in the day it was mecca yep and benny arquides at one point in time was the man when it came to kickboxing in america i got really lucky in that uh, i always used my uh my celebrity as a passport yeah to meet people to get involved in school and learn from those folks right and uh all the stuff you know the people that you're mentioning i still use their warm-up tips i still use those training ideas and how i eat and everything is you know Really, it's been the balance for me. Are you like really careful with your diet? 
You're call, obviously fit. You, I, call, look, I call it a crocodile, like a crocodile. It's mostly birds and uh, whatever kind of greenery comes with it. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally, a fish gets in there, <laughs> but mostly it's chickens uh, and a turkeys. wounded antelope that fucks up and gets too close to the water hole. Chickens and turkeys and uh, greenery and whatever falls in with it. Not a meat fan. Uh, no, I love it, but uh, not so much. Much anymore. Got to really watch out. Do you find health-wise there's repercussions to eating meat? Like, oh yeah, you yeah. bet, man. You can't outrun that cheeseburger. Well, okay, and, cheeseburgers, and, right? But what about like grass-fed beef or anything like that? You, you have to with... be so careful because uh, you know the mistake that most of us make is, oh well, my pants size hasn't changed since junior college, so I'll uh, just continue with the diet. Mm -hmm. But then uh, your metabolism slows down and. You know, you got to watch out because uh, you'll be eating a lot of red meat or things that are like, you know, whatever, French fries, etc. And thinking that because your pant size hasn't changed, that you're in front of it. Mm -hmm. And that ain't the case. You can't outrun it. You got to balance out what you eat with how much you actually train. Do you ever <clears throat> talk to a nutritionist? Do you, do you like read books on any of that stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah, been through many nutritionists. My mm -hmm. sister was a nutritionist for many years. You don't really have to worry too much about red meat. You know, with, with red meat, the real issue with red meat is people that are fat and people that uh, are not exercising and people that are, uh, especially if you're eating a lot of corn-fed meat, there's a lot of fat in corn-fed meat. But meat itself, as long as it's in moderation, especially grass-fed meat, is actually pretty good for you. I love red meat. Game, especially wild game. The issue with grass-fed meat, like people, well, what's the big deal with grass-fed? It tastes different. Well, it doesn't just taste different. It's a healthier animal. First of all, animals are not supposed to be eating corn. Cows are not naturally designed to eat corn. In fact, watch the movie Food, Inc. if you're curious about oh, that. Oh, I think I've seen that. It's terrible. It's terrible for their bodies. And that's what makes them so fucking fat and delicious when you slap <laughs> them bitches down on a grill. And it's that ribeye steak and all that yeah. fat. And it's but it's not nearly as healthy for you as uh, grass-fed meat. Grass-fed beef is actually it actually aids your body in burning fat. Uh, grass-fed beef for athletic performance is far superior to corn-fed meat. You're eating a healthy animal as opposed to a sick animal, and it's just going to be just more nutritious. There's there's more vitamins in it. There's more nutrients. It's it's far better for you, and it tastes different. Um, it's less fatty, so it's not quite as tender. But I like it. I like it more. I, I prefer like the taste of grass fed meat and the taste of wild game to fatty cor like corn fed beef because I know what's going on. That said, every now and then, a little in and out three by three. With some fries, <laughs> you know, yeah. But what about it. like double guy. double? Yeah, the, I go with three trouble. by three. I don't. I figure if I'm eating a burger, I'm gonna have three patties. Fuck it. What about though, like like cholesterol though? Cholesterol is only an issue again if you are not monitoring it, if you're not watching your diet, if you have some hereditary issues, and if you're not exercising on a regular basis. You gotta you gotta create a nuclear blast furnace that everything gets tossed into, and the only way to do that is to put your body in this constant state of recovery. You're constantly breaking it down and constantly recovering it, so your body is constantly in this state where it knows it has to perform athletically. It has to burn off flesh. It's not gonna waste any effort. It's not gonna waste any uh, energy. Rather, it's gonna you're gonna make sure that when you're taking in nutrients they get absorbed as soon as you get sedentary and then you're eating like massive amounts of animal protein and then your body's just pooling up with fats you know it's and what's even worse for you honestly is fucking carbohydrates carbohydrates in, in massive quantities like most people eat them especially like sugars like you're talking about like ice cream and cake and so that stuff is just clogging you it's terrible for you it's it's in fact sugar is like really like a mild toxin it's not good for you in any way, shape, or form. You'll it's not so. It's not so mild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A good, a good wallop of sugar. Are you kidding? And some yeah. caffeine. Yeah. And uh, you can get a lot done. But it tastes yummy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to get past that. How do we turn into a nutrition conversation <laughs> with David Lee Roth? Because I wanted to know, because you're you're fit and you're energetic, and I wanted to know if you're like, but you're still smoking Marlboros. Yeah, on occasion. <laughs> Contradiction. <laughs> what to do, what to do. Do you find that in uh, Japan it's easier to maintain a healthy diet? Because they, they have a much less fatty diet over there than we do in America. Huh? It's so easy to Stevie Wonder it. You don't have to look around at all. You put <laughs> your, it's, it's insensitive, I know. But you put your hand over your eyes and just point. And you're, you're, we will be pointing somewhere that uh, is reasonable to eat. You know, 
like I, I said, I, my diet is basically, uh, you know, birds and fish and, and you know, rice and, you know, beans and the clean stuff. In, uh, in Japan, there's 3,000 variations of that. 3,000 variations of noodle soup. There's 3,000 variations of chicken on a stick. There's, I'm- I remember something you said to me at the comedy store. I've never forgot. I thought it was so funny. You were talking about uh, chicks, about uh, groupies, like really, really hot chicks that were fans, and about how like we're living in the Stairmaster era. You're like, these gals are in their 40s, and they look sensational. Like, nobody ever saw this before. You were like, is this ain't your mom's 40? You know, it's, it's true, right? Yes, it is true. It's a different, a different era. Oh, it's a hugely different era. And in Japan, you know, we were talking about yoga, and uh, women think nothing of going to a Bikram yoga session in the hot box with complete face makeup and complete hairdo, etc. In Japan, they do uh, that? Totally. The gyms yeah. are full. The women get dressed up like they're going to a fashion place. Wow. 100% of the time. Seems like heaven. Is they trying to hook up? Is that what it is? They're trying to it's, put out the signal? I think, uh, first off, in a country where virtually everybody has the same color hair, it's probably a little more difficult, you know, to stand out. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> think about it. Virtually everybody's got a black haircut in there. So, yeah. you know, right away you got your work cut out for you a little bit there. A little face paint goes a long way. Oh, hell yeah. What if you found out that that's not common practice? They're only doing it because they found out David Lee Roth was taking yoga there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and these bitches are like, this is the hookup. This is this haunts me. <laughs> 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 this is not the first uh, that I've had to examine this. <laughs> this idea <laughs> is it weird being that famous for so long i mean how do you you're such an easygoing guy i mean it's one of the things that impressed me the most when i met you at the comedy store you are the most normal like regular down-to-earth guy if someone didn't know you they would never know that you're like one of the biggest rock stars in the history of music you're a regular guy like the way you're here you didn't come with an entourage you just showed up by yourself like hey what's up you're like you're n- normal you know that's how the fuck did you maintain that? I get the balance. The balance is, uh, you know, a lot of what we're talking about, like in the martial arts and travel and whatnot, is I'm a beginner. I'm I'm not the boss. I'm not the alpha male. You follow when I go yeah. to uh, train in a class. I'm not the shot caller at all. Um, and I've always had that. I, I like uh, people in a general sense, con- being uh, conversant, being able to have conversation, to tell stories and carry on. <clears throat> it's a big part of um, what I do for a living. you got to be a people watcher. And if the world is constantly watching you, then everybody alters their behavior. you got to be able to kind of fit in the way a good uh, reporter might. You know, thinking like uh, if you were a wartime reporter, you don't want to wear bright colors. You want to just sort of fit in, blend right in, and always be there just a couple inches behind going, you know, i got a couple of questions. If if you got a second here, can I I ask you about that tank over there? That's a remarkable balance that you've been able to pull that off because most rock stars, when you meet them, they're just so removed from the general public. It makes the conversations a little awkward. It would make it really awkward, I would think, in you know, in terms of what do, what do you have that's mutual? What do you yeah. what do you know in right. your life that's mutual? What are the fascinations? Right. You know, what are what uh, what are your interests? You know, because that can be pretty uh, pretty diverse. You got to have a pretty diverse taste in things. Yeah, but your your whole personality is such a, a a different sort of take on things. Like I don't know a lot of people that would just go to Japan for ten months like that. And how, how old are you? Mm, 58. 58 years old, boom. You just fly to Japan for a fucking year. <laughs> That's not a lot of dude learning how to sword fight. I mean, it's fucking crazy. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's eccentric to a degree. Single, not tied down at all. Nope. Do whatever the fuck you want to do. Yep. You like a goddamn Leonard Skinner song. You like the breeze. <laughs> you don't give a fuck. You're just out there. I'm I mean, as free as a bird. <laughs> I mean, like legitimately, man. That's admirable. And you're <laughs> loving it. Look at you. You can't be happier. It's not possible to be happier than you. I, I idle somewhere between not too pissed and somewhat pissed. <laughs> That's how you idle? No, you're bullshit. That's you said that earlier. It's like you saying that you're hard to work with. You know? I don't think I'm hard to work with. I doubt frankly. you're hard to work no, with. No, I'm not hard to I work with. I bet you're hard to change. 
I bet you fight against someone trying to manipulate or or d- direct you. I remember. Yeah. I remember in, uh, when we were picking for a jury recently, about hey, well, it's a year ago, um, and they were picking for a murder trial over in uh, the Pasadena courthouse, and the fella says, uh, "Is there anybody here?" Who isn't going to get themselves disqualified? Is there anybody here who's qualified to uh, try this case? And I was the only one who raised his hand. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, I'm you know I'm, I'm willing to listen. And the, <laughs> and the guy says, uh, "Okay, sir." He says, uh, "I think I know who you are." He says, um, uh, "Would you uh, listen to everybody else's idea behind while you're deliberating on this trial?" I said, oh, "Certainly." He said, but you would try to convince them they were wrong if you had another idea, right? And I said, yes, that's accurate. And you dismissed me because of that. <laughs> <laughs> You're too charismatic. You're too charismatic. You would manipulate it in your favor. Well, you're the you know, lever. It, you're the it, lever it on the bench. Certainly not my one, my first time in the uh, Pasadena courthouse. You know when our first time was? Is Alex Van Halen and I had to sue the Mayfield School of the Holy Child of Jesus Incorporated for one hundred and twenty-five dollars. <laughs> this was in nineteen seventy-five, I think nineteen seventy-six. One hundred twenty-five. What was that about? Well, it was in a contract. We had played a uh, a dance, and in the one-page contract, it said there will be no smoking uh, backstage. There will be no marijuana consumed. There will be no drinking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, one of the sisters that was nuns at the time claimed that she uh, smelled pot smoke backstage and uh, refused to pass our $125 for the band. So Angry bitch. Was he, she right? Well, no. There was no pot smoke backstage. So she just made it up. Mm, she may have smelled Marlboros. You know, oh. Actually, those were camel, camel filters. But um, uh, Alex and I went and we bought uh, clip-on ties so we could fool the judge. <laughs> and we tied our hair back and we went to small claims court and filed. Did you win? Um well, what happened was uh, sat in front of the judge. We sat on one side, and on the other side, uh, two sisters, two nuns came in in a family, a father, a mother, and three of the daughters in school uniforms. You know, they played it up hard. And uh, the judge says, why, who filed here? I said, sir, I did. And he said, well, that's $125. And uh, there was no smoke, you know, there was no smoking of anything illegal backstage, whatever. And... Um, he had the uh, one of the nuns stand up, and she said, I refuse to pay him because I smelled marijuana smoke. And uh, the judge says, what is your answer to that, sir? And I stood up, and I said, sister, how do you know what marijuana smoke smells like? <laughs> $125 later. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Hey, paid yeah. for the T-shirt. Yeah, how would she know? <laughs> Silly bitch. Did you know that that's what they used to get, have in those incense things when the priest walks down the no. aisle? Yes. No. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. They burn cannabis. Yeah. They actually used to use cannabis oil. They used to use uh, cannabis oil underneath their, their, their religious hats. Yeah, it's common practice. Canna- I did not cannabis know that. was used as a sacrament for a, a lot of different religions. I did not know that. I thought it was yeah. like incense or something. Yeah, it is now, you know. Yeah, but it, there's a lot of evidence that uh, cannabis was used. In that way, have, has Calm Dave, everybody down. Has Dave Grohl stuff. ever contacted you about? There was like a rumor going back a couple months ago that if they're, they ever put together Nirvana, that they would want you as the lead singer. Whoa! Have you? Did you even hear about this, or did they ever even contact you about that? Cause well, uh, there's a whole lot of noise uh, backstage going on at uh, at at these affairs. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, what started it was there was a picture of me with the um, Jonas Brothers at a Christmas party. And uh, the rumor got started that I was actually going to be in the Jonas Brothers. (laughs) (laughs) And (laughs) so uh, I helped to fuel that rumor. Did you? Yes, I did. Did you ever meet Kurt? Or were you a fan of Nirvana? Uh, let's stick with the Jonas Brothers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh snap! No, I did not. Uh, I did not know the uh, the fellas uh, at the time. I'm I'm since met Dave, but um, I don't know uh, the grunge movement so well. 
But um, the uh, rumor started backstage at the uh, Henson Recording Studio at a Christmas party. And then uh, a number of people started getting involved in it. You know, Did you spread that rumor at all as well? Mm, I did. <laughs> I, I, I put that on the, uh, on the Internet. You know, it's, uh, you know, who am I to get in the way of a good rumor? Now, if someone wants to watch your show, what is uh, the, the best way to – is it on iTunes? Yeah, iTunes.com, it... uh, The Roth Show, you can get DavidLeeRoth.com, the website. You can find this pretty easily here. So yeah, so I'm on davidleeroth.com. Who's, what is this, this this photograph? What is that of? Uh, just the latest photo. That's uh, something from New York City. What is that that thing you're standing in? Mm, it's actually a table. Somebody built a table by the water. It's kind of odd looking. Huh? It's a dope picture. Um, and your show is also on YouTube as well. Yep. So you can, how many episodes have you done so far? Ooh, we're up to, I think, number 11, and we just passed uh, two and a half million downloads. So oh, it's time wow. to talk about it. Powerful, and, beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's off and running. Yep. Well, uh, we'll get some people on it, man. Uh, go now, ladies and gentlemen. Go check out davidleeroth.com. Go. Um, go on iTunes, subscribe, go on YouTube, subscribe, listen, watch, learn, take it all in, bitches. You've been blessed. We need to go to Japan and visit. I okay. Think. Well, <laughs> you know what? Um, I'll probably go um, uh, if they have a uh, UFC pay-per-view there again. Yeah. The UFC is doing very well in Japan. So if we do, we'll party, man. I'll bring you down there. We'll get some sushi together. We'll have a fucking vegetable shinding. We'll have a great time. Eat like crocodiles. Watch some dudes kick some ass. Hopefully no dudes with no dicks with beat up chicks. <laughs> and I'll have to eat my words. Imagine if I have to call a transgender versus a woman. I'm just meeting these people, they're going to be pissed. Well, listen, man. I told them I support your right to be that person. I don't have no problem with you and your choices, but you can't be knocking out chicks 20 seconds. That's like that sounds like what it would be if a guy was fighting a chick. Yeah, right hear about a, a twenty second knockout. Yeah, that sounds about right. You're beating up girls, you fuck. <laughs> anyway, powerful David Lee Roth. Thank you very much. Joe, sir. Thank you. It's been an honor. This was real. a blast. This is. We were looking forward to this for weeks. We're so psyched about today, and uh, it was as good as it could have. Like could have possibly asked for. Thank if you, you ever want to do it again, man, please, anytime. You tell me, I'll fucking we'll start this bitch up in the middle of the night for you. <laughs> we'll come down here and crank it over. Standing. Right. David Lee Roth on Twitter, DavidLeeRoth.com. Go take it all in, you fucks. Uh, thanks to Hover for uh, sponsoring our show. Go to hover.com forward slash Rogan and get 10% off your domain name registrations. Thanks also to Squarespace. If you go to squarespace.com forward slash Joe, you can check it all out. And if you use the, co the offer code Joe2, you can get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. Remember, if you can go there, you just try it out. You don't even have to pay for it when you, you try it out. You can start building a website. If you like it, you decide to purchase, use the offer code Joe2 and get 10% off. All right, we will see you guys back to, no, this Friday night. Friday. This Friday night with uh, Theoretical. Medical physicist uh, Dr. Amit Goswami. I hope I'm saying his name right, but he is a fascinating, fascinating man, and he's going to talk to us about the nature of reality and matter and string theory. And it's you're gonna you're gonna want to take notes and you're gonna want to be high as fuck. Okay, <laughs> we'll see you guys Friday. God bless and jihad to you all. Bye.